our new Finance and Operations Committee, and we're going to call it to order. Um, we're missing a couple regions, but I assume they'll be here. They come in every day. My, my first order of business is I notice we've added some space onto the horseshoe for student representatives. And it's my understanding that we have new student representatives now and that they will be rotating through some of the committees instead of being on committees in general. Um, we have Ms. Eulen from Duluth and Ms. Dean from Crookston joining us today. Uh, Ms. Eulen, do you wanna just tell us in, in a minute or so uh, your story? <laughs> what got you here? <laughs> well, I was getting involved with student government my freshman year. Um, I heard about the representative to the Board of Regents position, but I had no idea what any of it was. And uh, quite honestly, it felt like she was speaking a foreign language at every meeting she came to. Um, but I learned more about the position, and I just thought it would be a good way to represent the student body of the University of Minnesota system. Thank you, thank you. And Ms. Dean, who represents uh, Minnesota University of Minnesota at Crookston. Hi, all right, so um, I'm a junior at Crookston this year. I am an agricultural business major with a communication minor. I started getting involved with student government my freshman year as a club representative, and then my sophomore year as our senator of community service. And then last year, if uh, you'll all remember, Taryn Stomberg, our rep from last year, uh, started telling me a little bit about the region's position at the beginning of last year and um, kind of got me excited about it and just the unique opportunity that we have here to work with this body. So I got a little bit more excited about it as the year went on, tried to learn as much about it as I could and then ran for it at the end of the year. Thank you and welcome. Thank Hope you. Enjoy your year. Um, we're going to get going. The first, the first item on the agenda is, is virtually just our overview of our work plan this year and if, if there's any discussion I'm just going to point out by saying that you know I've been down here several times working on this a couple of highlights I think is that um, we're going to be looking at student housing across the system I think that comes in December uh, in February we're going to talk about the campus neighborhood and how we engage with the neighborhood around us, uh, potential you know, commercial investments, things like that. Uh, and in May, we are gonna have uh, long-range planning um, and implications to the system-wide strategic plan. And finally in June, well, we're gonna talk about long-range planning on the St. Paul campus in addition to all of our other general items. So I don't know, does anybody have any questions on, on our work schedule for this year. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to just move into the next item, but I'll, if anybody has any questions on why we chose what we did. Great. Uh, we're gonna have a full meeting today and I'm hoping we can stay on task and on schedule. Uh, I'm new up here, just tell you that the view is different. Let me just tell you, the view is very different. Uh, but we'll see. I, I appreciate the confidence uh, Chair McMillan has given me in this, and we'll, we'll see if I can uphold that. So we are going to go to the next item agenda. The President's re recommended six-year capital plan and 2018 state capital request. I'm going to ask Senior Vice President uh, Brian Burnett to uh, take us away on that. And we've got some speakers at the table, so uh, Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Good morning, members of the board um, and the audience. Uh, today we're uh, pleased to present the first of two presentations we will have on the six-year capital plan and the state capital request. Um, joining at the table is also Interim Vice President Mike Bertelson from University Services. Um, we will focus this month on the facility condition data that shape our plan and the related request. And next month at the October meeting, we will spend time on the state data and analysis analysis that we consider as we develop these items. <coughs> um, the six-year plan is required by the board. We can get slide to move. Uh -huh. Okay. So the six-year plan, again, as I said, is required by board policy. 
Um, it is the, the official document that sets direction for capital projects across the entire University of Minnesota. Um, because we have limited resources and limited capacity for projects, we must ensure that our highest priorities show up here. Um, university priorities do change, as does the makeup of the state legislature and the economy that supports state bonding. This plan provides for variability, particularly in the out years. And finally, this is the tool that we use to build future state requests and capital budgets. In fact, year one of the six-year plan is always the upcoming state capital request. There are two primary pieces that inform our plan. First and foremost are mission priorities. These are gathered and prioritized by the provost, the vice president for research, and the vice president for health services. We also collect and analyze our facility priorities. As you well know, there are many. In your DACA material, you saw that our projected 10-year deferred capital renewal need is just about $4.2 billion. The Capital Strategy Group looks at both of these priority areas and puts together a draft six-year capital plan, which the President reviews and approves for submission to the board. Sometimes a story can be best told in a chart. What you see here in gold is the building profile for all of the colleges and universities that are assessed by the Sightlines Group. We contract with Sightlines to conduct our facility condition assessments and do, as do most other Big Ten institutions and hundreds of others across the country. This wavy line represents the building profile for the Twin Cities campus. What it tells us is that major building life cycles here at the university are coming due for renewal sooner than other universities because our buildings, our campus was built in general old sooner and older than most campuses across the country. In the orange box is our, is our space built during an era of generally lower quality, construction quality. It totals 8.6 million gross square feet and is about 52% of our total campus. And it is our primary need from a facility condition perspective. Another analysis looks at dollars spent on renewal. These gold bars represent the total investment in our facility renewal. They include both budgeted R&R and HEPR dollars, which explains the wide degree of variability. The red line represents the minimum investments that we should be making just to get things, to ensure things don't get worse. The second higher red line is the amount that we should be spending on to actually decrease our deferred capital renewal. Funding at this level would be consistent with what is done in some of the private sector. The reality is no campus in Sightline works um, to help meet, actually in Sightline actually meets this top line. Anything in the middle is good, but not great. As Senior Vice President Burnett noted, we have $4.2 billion in projected needs over the next 10 years. We also have 8.3 million square, square feet in poor or critical condition. For a top tier research institution, this is just not acceptable and has impacts in the classroom, in the lab, and in the marketplace. Starting on the Twin Cities campus, and progressing to the system campuses over time, we have started to classify every building into one of these three categories, to catch up, sustain, or dispose. Oftentimes, without strategic planning, renewal dollars can get sucked up by dispose buildings simply because of their age and needs. By setting a strategic vision for every facility, we can ensure our dollars are spent wisely on facilities we intend to keep for the long term. This plan places a very strong emphasis on protecting and preserving what we already have. There is very limited new in this plan, which you will see shortly. The, priority, the priorities you see here are the same ones we've had for the past few years. First and foremost, we seek to reduce poor and critical space. This is a board progress card in your maroon measure. The health sciences remain a top priority for this board, the administration, and our state. Uh, we have needs across our system, but particularly on the St. Paul campus. And the state has made investments in STEM, particularly on the Duluth campus, and we have additional needs that are a priority to accommodate expected enrollment growth in these fields. And finally, we have projects on the Morris and Twin Cities campus that seek to address changing uses and demands of our libraries from our students. 
I mentioned that we have limited new dollars in this project proposed plan for the board. In fact, only $6 million is currently identified for wholly new facilities, and that's a fundraise project, fundraise projects at the Arboretum. In our complete facility renewal category, we do have some space that will be raised and rebuilt. For example, a poor quality wing on Fraser Hall will be demolished and a new wing constructed in its place. By and large, though, you, you note that this plan places its strong emphasis on HEPR. As in the past, we rely on our partners at the state, in the legislature, and the governor's office for the vast majority of our capital funding, and this year is no different. And of course, every six year plan is a bit aspirational. Um, completion of the named projects in this plan addresses to um, 1.3 million gross square feet, or about 15 and a half percent of poor and critical space identified. Heaper is spent across the system and across all buildings, so we spend it on the good buildings too in order to keep them in good or great shape. Full funding of the Heaper request is estimated to reduce an additional 13 and a half percent of poor and critical needs. All in all, with a plan this aggressive, we can eliminate about a third of our poor and critical space across the system. So our state capital request to preview for you here, um, Vice President Kramer will speak a bit more about this in October at your meeting when we are focused on the state aspects of these plans. But HEPR, as always, is our number one priority and we are going to be requesting from the state $200 million which would span all the campuses with square footage and our research and outreach centers. Investments across the system in the Greater Minnesota Academic Renewal would touch the Duluth, the Morris, and the Crookston campuses. And the long-standing Pillsbury Hall priority is our third priority. I believe it's been on the capital list for about 12 years at a minimum. But those would be, um, uh, for the board's discussion today, uh, we believe a uh, thoughtful and directed state request, particularly with what's going on down the street in St. Paul, is our best chance for success in the upcoming legislative session. And with that, uh, Interim Vice President Bertelson and I are happy to take any questions that the board has on this proposed um, state capital request. Terrific. Thank you for the uh, information. I'm sure some of my colleagues would like to ask some questions. Does anybody want to ask questions about our uh, Regent Lucas? Thank you, Chair. Um, I totally support this plan, and I'm so happy to see that Pillsbury Hall is still in the request. Thank you. Just to remind the board, that will include, it's a two-thirds, one-third with the state, so the $24 million would be the state portion. We would have to come up with 12. It's right now identified as a $36 million project and would be home to the English department as we've currently programmed that, re that remodel. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Richard Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burnett, or, uh, Mr. Bertelson, a question on HEPRA, and that is, what's the priorities, how do you get the priorities of 200 million? Uh, when does the parking lot at Crookston take precedence over a parking lot at Rochester, for instance? I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. making it simple. How, how do you get to that priority list? Um, sure, um, Mr. Chair, Regent Johnson. Um, the first thing we do is we, we have an allocation to set targets by each of the campuses. And so um, we look at a combination of how much space each campus has and um, looking at the facility condition need. So uh, there's a, um, a formula we've developed that balances those two issues and comes up with a percent of the total request, whatever that number is. Each campus then is assigned um, that amount. Then within each campus, then they are looking at the priorities within their space. And that they too primarily are driven by the facility condition assessment and where are the most, the biggest risks. And so you start with health and safety. Um, you look at what's putting the build, any given building at risk, you know, as a roof in danger, in which case water damage could um, do significant damage. Um, and then you start looking at is there opportunities to fix keeper issues that also advanced academic priorities so that you can leverage the HEPA dollars to get a, um, an impact both not on the facility but on the, the program as well. So it's sort of an iterative process. We look to each campus, we work through those. We also get impact from the code office where they see risk. Um, 
and then through a series of conversations, we developed those priorities. Thank you, Vice President Burleson. Okay with that? Thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, curious if somebody can maybe interim Vice President Bertelson can just give a thumbnail overview of what is eligible as HEPR, because sometimes that line gets a little blurry for me and I probably should have done my homework. Um, that'd be helpful. Vice President uh, Bertelson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Regent McMillan. So uh, HEPR, uh, higher edu education asset preservation and replacement. Um, I think the replacement part is probably the key to the kind of understanding that. Um, the definition in statute, frankly, is a little bit more broad than the legislature politically, historically, has been willing to accept. Um, so our target is about replacing buildings in kind. So, um, but it's not about programmatic change. So as long as you have a um, an engineering building that's being renovated that will still be an engineering building and you're replacing building infrastructure, the utilities, the shell, um, HVAC systems, plumbing, um, all those components are fine and eligible. When you start turning an office into a lab or a classroom into um, offices, whatever that change would be, or even upgrading, really investing in programmatic system or programmatic teaching or technology, those things are really outside of the bounds of what HEPR was designed for. And that's where the university then can add its own resources to make those adjustments. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman? Regional Mari. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Anderson. I have a, a couple questions about specific projects over the, the six-year plan. The first one um, is related to Boynton and uh, the HVAC and some other interior things. Can we get a sense of how long we think Boynton will be an active building for us? Um, that's a good question, uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Omari. Um, you know, I think we that's a building that's sort of been on the edge for us. Um, it's one that we've... Um, I think we do not see in the 50-year future, but we don't, um, what we came to in the conversation with the point is don't, don't see anything in the next 10 to 15 years that would push us to probably move, eliminate it. And we don't have another option in mind or in place. And so sort of targeted investments which maintain the function of the building um, feel like prudent advance, investments at this time. So we are more in the sort of stabilized plan, uh, mode for that building not sort of lots of investment to make it brand new, uh, but not in the place that we have an active plan to move out of it. <clears throat> Thank you. Regent Amari? Thank you. Uh, given that there's no time frame on this building, that'll be something for us as a board to keep in mind uh, as this moves up the priority list. And then uh, two questions that are somewhat related. One, was there a recent renovation of Shepherd Hall? Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Tomari, there is one in progress. And in progress currently, and yes. we're looking to do more with labs that's an additional cost. Yes. Okay. So I'm just thinking, I, I don't know very much about this business, but what it looks like to do it in phases versus having an all-in uh, bid. And then from the St. Paul gym, um, why is the gym, the actual gym, and then the rec center separated as two different items? Mr. President Burleson. Um, Regent, uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Amari, I am guess I have to go look that one up. I'm not perfectly clear on that one. Sometimes what we do is they, we label them based upon exactly where the work is in the building. So that we, they certainly is one building. I mean, there's the gym, the whole rec center in St. Paul is one facility. Um, but for clarity of the project as we start, it depend, we will label it. Sometimes it depends if it's a different contractor, if it's going to be a different effort, we will give it a different project name and therefore they fall out differently. But it's not because it's a different funding source or um, that would be through rec sports and student fees. It, if I may, Mr. Chair, the only reason I ask is, I mean, there's clearly a need to upgrade the entire facility. And so um, I think figuring out how we might be able to do both together would make more sense in my mind as we bid. But again, I, I don't have your job, so this is just my thinking about how it would make sense. Well, Mr. Chair, Regent Mark, I think you're, you're right that we always are looking for uh, opportunities for, and even though two projects are sometimes shown separately, that doesn't mean we don't 
there's a times we still have, we merge them into be one bid from a contracting perspective. So the needs identification and the project ID sometimes is separate so we can identify the different need. Um, but capital planning is always looking for, is there, are the contractors somebody that could do both and there's efficiencies to be gained or are they separate enough that they're, um, or there's something unique about the timing that requires them to be different. So we do look for those opportunities. Thank you. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Interim Vice President Bertelson, I, it looks like we're now including uh, renovation repair projects on here, which I think is a good thing. I just, that <coughs> looks like a change uh, from what we've done in the past. So that that's our internal money we're spending mm -hmm. for less significant repairs and renovations, and that's about 40 or $50 million a year, so it's not inconsequential. Uh, my point is I think it's important that we have it in this report, and it is now um, um, as, uh, as one item. The, uh, I made this comment before. I worry more about what's not on the list versus what's on the list, and I'm pleased to see you place <coughs> some projects that are that are out there several years, but which aren't defined as to cost or specificity. And Mr. Chair, Regent Beeson, just briefly, you're right that it, for the six, we always have tracked those pools in the annual capital budget, but we haven't always put those university funded pool re, um, investment and renewal pools in the six year plan. We felt that this was with a focus on renewal that it was important for the university to show its contribution and self-investment. At the same time, we're asking for more money from the state in that same sort of a tool. And it is, as you said, a significant amount of money and something that we need to be planful about. So we do have six-year plans in housing, parking, facilities, utilities, um, and we are planful in each of those areas as well. Thank you. Um, we're running up kind of on the timing issue, but we have a couple more people. I'll just ask that you can be brief if you can, uh, Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two quick uh, issues, one which I had uh, some contact with the President this week, and I noticed our project in capital year 2017, number 138, is the practice facility at Bolstead Field. Uh, is there any further discussions about improvements of the actual golf course uh, in any of, of these plans? Um, Vice President, or Vice President Burleson? Mr. Chair, Regent Johnson, uh, there has been ongoing conversations about what the right plan and future is. So we know there are needs. We know the golf course is currently functional and operational. Um, and but uh, they're look, we're both kind of paying it, look, trying to see <clears throat> what the time frame of that um, renewal or future plan should be. Should we be thinking how how long should we be looking? So we've. We're sort of doing short-term, moderate-term, and long-term planning sort of simultaneously. And I, we really uh, haven't really come to a, uh, out, a conclusion yet as to that plan. Mr. Chairman, clarification, is the golf course now under the Department of Athletics or is it part of recreational? Uh, rec sports. Rec sports. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask another, another question. Uh, and. Uh, Regent Swigum could appreciate this as we talk about the pool of money in, in HEPRA as it pertains to the legislature. And I'm trying to think a bit strategically and politically here how we might do a better job. Because what happens at the end of the negotiating legislative session, folks look over and say, oh, there's uh, 80 million over there in HEPRA. We could take 10 or 15 million. And on behalf of Mr. Kramer and his team, how we might make that a little more strategic, and that is to actually demonstrate to legislators, if you cut this 10 or 15 million, here's what's going to happen on these particular projects. And it, I'm not sure we've been able to communicate that in a most strategic, politically savvy way to them, because they just think this pool of money, let's take 10, 15, 20 million, and get the bonding bill done. And so I'm trying to think through that a little more uh, uh, strategically, if you will. And I know Mr. Kramer, who's here, and your team, you, you've thought about it, but something to think about. Okay, Senior Vice President Burnett, quickly on that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Regent Johnson, I think two things. One, uh, 
being strategic about a narrow request of only three items is part one. Part two is our team is already working with uh, Vice President Kramer's team to know if it were not 200 million, if it was 150, what it would look like, if it was 100, and having that data ready for our folks at the Capitol will absolutely show them in stark terms what falls off the list at each level. So we, we're preparing for that mm -hmm. while we make the case that 200 million is really trying to catch up on some investments that were made long ago. So your point's well taken. We're gonna prepare in that manner with, with Vice President Kramer and his team. Thank you. Uh, Regent Sviggum. Mr. Chairman, members, um, I, I'm just going to make a couple comments I'd like you to think about before October when we make final decisions on this request. Uh, um, the first being, I recognize that the need is there. The capital deferred need is there, no question. Uh, but it's also there in my house at home. You know, that's why I'm not going to get a patio set until two years, and I'm not going <laughs> to replace the water heater until three years from now. And the roof will probably have to wait five years. Okay? So we're all in that same situation. I. Uh, I guess my first question, Vice President Prudent, is what is happening at St. Paul? You mentioned over at St. Paul. What's happening in St. Paul that makes you think we can be successful in a $234.5 million request? Uh, you know, you want a, a good coach wants to put his or her players in a position to be successful. That's a winning program, you know, a girls or a boys uh, program. What, what makes you think we can be successful at $234 million? Senior Vice President Burnett. Mr. Chairman, Regent Sviggum, I think the, the idea is this is a work in progress and having a very narrow set of taking care of what we have versus asking for new buildings with given the level of uh, um, uh, discourse between the legislative branch and the executive branch right now is, is part of what uh, we think a strategy. We do not believe that the Minnesota state system will be shy about asking for HEPR as well. And I think we have to have our marker in about what we need. Now, whether we get this or not, um, a lot a lot will happen between now and the next legislative session. But I think having a very thoughtful um, stewardship story um, and hopefully some uh, partnering with the legislature and the governor's office could uh, yield some results. So I think we need to have, we need to be able to show our needs and not be shy about what the capital needs are for our existing buildings across our campuses. Mr. Chairman, Vice President Burnett, you're not shy by any means. Mm. <laughs> this is a very bold request and I don't think it's one that probably puts us in the position of being successful. Okay. Um, personal feeling. I did a little minimal research, members. I only do minimal research. <laughs> our average, our average over the last 15 years in a bonding bill for the university is a little over $68 million. <clears throat> now there were <clears throat> a few years we got zero. There was no bonding bill like 2004. Uh, there were some years we didn't have a bonding bill, so that changes the average a little bit, but it was 68 million. This request is three times that, uh, over three times that. Normally, in a bonding bill, the university will get somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the bonding bill. I think the average is 13 percent that we get. Representative or, uh, Regent Johnson, you know that the legislature is not going to pass a billion dollar bonding bill. They're going to stay away from the 1B. That's a talking point. Right? So it might be in the neighborhood of $800 million in GO bonds. Uh, that would be a great guess at this time if you're going to place a marker down. That's a, if, you, if you get 13% of that, you know, you're somewhere in the neighborhood of $115, $120 million. I want to put ourselves in a position of not asking for something we're not going to get and being very direct, very honest with the legislature. Heeper, I like the focus towards Heeper. In fact, I would ask only for Heeper, but uh, uh, Regent Lucas, we have a very good author on the Pillsbury Bill. He happens to be the chair of the committee, so I think that is a, that's a very good author. Uh, but, but I would encourage you to look in October when we uh, make the request of uh, toning it down a little bit. Uh, not that the need isn't there. I know the need's there. You know the need's there, but, but let's be successful and let's, uh, you know, if, if we ask for 150 million, as opposed to 234, we go to them and we say, this is a bottom line, it's not a negotiable figure, we're not trying to outdo Minsku, we're not trying to put ourselves in a position that just the dollars aren't gonna come. But if you look at the history, uh, the chance of a $234 million request is 
pretty much zero. Thank you, thank you, Regent Spigum. We've only got a few minutes left, and we've got three speakers, so I'm gonna ask that you could try to be brief, and we'll try to get all of you in there. Regent Hsu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple quick questions. Uh, the first one regarding Keeper is, uh, do we ever, I mean, I'm sure you, I'm sure the answer is pretty uh, quick, but uh, how do we ever know how much Heaper money we have currently that hasn't been spent? And number two, I think looking at the list, without a, a system-wide strategic plan, it uh, is very difficult to make t any determinations on where we should be allocating funds in this. And I know that there's been a lot of talk about chemistry. Well, chemistry is um, causing uh, pipeline problems with uh, graduation rates and all sorts of things in terms of number of heads we can uh, put into the uh, College of Science and Engineering, et cetera. Uh, the Mayo building, not sure what's going on with that. Um, I, I understand we're decommissioning it, which means we're not supposed to be investing in it, but then I hear we're investing in it. and So I'm not sure what's going on with that, but those are basically my question. Hey, senior, our Interim Vice President Bertelson, could you answer those? Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Chu, uh, yes, we monthly track and I know exactly where we are in every heaper and R&R project and if projects come in less, we quickly turn that around and reinvest it. Um, I'll come back to the middle one. Mayo, um, we are actively working on plans to try to figure out where to put people, but it's, um, we also know that regardless if it's a building we want to take, ultimately take down decommission, um, we, as long as we have people in the building, we have to make sure it's a safe condition. So we target investments just to make sure the program can continue and that people are safe and we try to limit it to those kind of situations. Um, and as to the chemistry, um, we recognize that as a significant need. Um, we know that that's a challenge. Uh, largely it comes down to the conversation we were having with Regent Swigum. How much money do we ask for and how do we fit that into a, a package at a time? Um, we have been and are finished, still doing the pre-design on the, the chemistry teaching facility um, and trying to wrap that up in the next several months, which will give us clarity about options and the next step. Thank you. Regent Lucas, do you have questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one question, and maybe I didn't read carefully enough. Is, is there money in there for Eddie Hall, which I understand is vacant? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, no. And we don't have... Uh, today we don't have a good plan um, for the best use of that. We've had different ideas over the time and it's something we're still working on to try to figure out the right programmatic solution that ties to a financial solution. We're still working on that. Not giving up. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'm, I'm distressed that uh, Regent Svigum is lacking a patio set. <laughs> <laughs> on the way in this morning, one of my neighbors had one out by the out by the road with a free sign. If you want to take a look at it, if you got a pickup, I'll help you uh, grab that later. But and on on the point that Regent Sigum made, I, I I think that's a it's a fair point. But in, I'm operating a little bit without the research that obviously um, uh, my colleague has done. But I think that there actually is a pretty good argument for providing a larger range. Um, and because I think that there's also, I, I, I guess this is sort of a um, uh, isolated incident, but at one time in an older day when you were in a different role, uh, the university had, uh, we sought to respond, and it very well may have been to your, um, your call as, a, as one of the leaders at the time at the legislature, uh, to have a more um, modest request. These are our absolute bottom line needs in, in relation to other state entities that were giving these larger re, uh, demands. And, and we found that essentially they just took a percentage off of everybody's requests and so we actually ended up being hurt by that. So I think that there still is, there is to some extent, there's still a logical consideration that, that if you're asking for a smaller amount that that will be perceived as a, a, less, a less of a demand. So it's sort of like being a, you know, if you're the only defensive driver in town, you're going to be stuck at the stop sign all day. And, and so we need to make sure that we're not taking that posture while other people are taking a more aggressive one in a way that would, I think, um, you know, hinder our ability to, uh, to to meet our needs that are every bit and in often cases um, greater than, than some of the other entities. Uh, Mr. Chair, just the, the, the question that I would ask, and I don't know if this goes to President Kaler or um, uh, who it would go to, but I, I look at these, and, and this is a kind of a constant question, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the thought process of our our desire to control the priority against 
opportunity for success if there is a popular interest in the legislature to fund something that isn't listed as one of our priorities. If it, if it becomes apparent that there's an appetite at the legislature to support something that we don't place as a highest priority, how do we balance our desire to control our priorities against our opportunity to have things uh, supported? Great, great question. President Kaler, you want to take a stab at that? Absolutely, uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Rocha. Thank you. That's a great question. And uh, the example of doing that is actually the Bell Museum. So we put the Bell Museum forward um, a few years ago, not as a very uh, high priority. Uh, it became clear there was interest um, in, the, uh, in the House in particular. Uh, at that uh, point in time to, to fund that uh, outside the normal process. So uh, we were pretty nimble uh, working with board leadership and, and with the board and succeeded in having that project uh, fully funded uh, by the state with some contributions from philanthropy. So uh, we try to be nimble. Uh, we try, which is you know a little bit hard for us sometimes, uh, and we try to be responsive and take advantage of opportunities. So again, that's, um, that's listening, communicating, and trying to act when opportunity shows itself. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, great discussion. Very brief. Very, very brief, Regent Rocha. I'm new at this. I can't say no, so go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Anderson. Thank you, and Regent Rocha. I understand that strategy. I just happen to disagree with it. I, I, I just, it's not where I am in life, and I was never that way as a leader, and I hope not here as a regent. So I just don't understand the strategy. And to that patio set, <laughs> I would suggest this. That patio set that was sitting out of that front lawn says free. If the guy will put $200 on it, it's probably gone the next morning. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough, Regent Stringer. Uh, Vice President Bertelson, thank you for your presentation. A lot of, lot of discussion on that, a lot of interest. Uh, we'll see where it goes. We're ready next. We're going to let some people change up at the, uh, what I like to call the witness table. And we're going to move into our expansion of commercial paper program, which again is an item for review. Uh, we'll let these people get um, seated. That's right. It's a minority interest. And once they are seated, we are going to ask uh, Senior Vice President Brian Burnett to explain this program to us. Okay, as they're getting settled, members of the committee will keep moving this along. The next agenda item is a discussion with you about implementing a new type of debt program here at the University of Minnesota. When I arrived late last year and had a chance to review our debt program, I was struck by the fact that we could benefit from a more robust commercial paper program than we currently have. I asked Associate Vice President Volna and Debt Director Carol Fleck, who are with us, to pull together an outline for a program based on best practices at the universities of Missouri, Michigan, Virginia, other flagship universities that have had a program like this in place for quite some time. The docket materials and slide deck provide the background about what is being proposed. Um, Associate Vice President Volna, Director uh, Carol Fleck, and Associate Vice President and Chief Investment Officer Stuart Mason, who has a role in this as well, will walk through the slides and you should feel free to ask questions and engage in a discussion about this expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Anderson, members of the committee, thank you very much. As uh, Senior Vice President Burnett said, uh, he charged us last uh, fall, winter, <clears throat> to take a look at this. We did have the opportunity to do some research, and we have confirmed that, in fact, uh, an expanded and different type of commercial paper program than what we currently have done uh, would actually yield some real benefits uh, to the University of Minnesota. So we've put together a framework for how this would uh, move forward. We're gonna, I'm going to turn it over to Carol Fleck, and she will walk through some of the specifics. Stuart Mason can talk to you a little bit about some of the opportunities and the opportunity costs. So uh, we will be seeking your approval at some point here in the next meeting or two uh, to expand the commercial paper program to the parameters that we will be outlining here. Carol? Good morning. Our current issuance process, whether we use CP or long-term debt, has been based on specific projects that require debt financing, and each issuance has been identified as a specific series, for example, Series 2016A or CP Notes Series F. The boxes on this slide show the process flow we currently follow. At various stages within the annual capital budget process, the individual projects and related plan of financing are approved by the Board of Regents. 
The project begins and we use university cash to pay for the construction costs. During this time, we obtain an estimated cash flow projection from capital planning to help us determine the timing of our debt issuance. Our goal is to be able to use the proceeds over a two-year period, meeting six-month spending guidelines in order to retain any arbitrage we might make on the proceeds. When we are ready to start the issuance process, we bring a formal resolution um, re related to the issuance of debt to the board for approval to allow us to proceed with the issuance of debt. The issuance process takes two months on average from the kickoff to the final closing when the cash is received and deposited in a separate account in the custodian bank. As I previously mentioned, this amount is designated for specific projects and identified by a specific series number. The debt proceeds are then drawn from the custodian bank account into our general account to reimburse ourselves for the construction expenses previously paid for with university cash. That totally elapsed time covers several months from the time the university cash is spent and ultimately reimbursed. You can see by the maroon bars in the bottom of the boxes where the board is involved in this process, approving the projects and authorizing the debt issuance. The CP issued under a formal CP program is cash flow based. In other words, how much cash do we need immediately to pay for construction costs? In this case, the Board of Regents approves the CP program via a formal resolution at the start of the process flow. At various stages within the capital budget process, again, the individual projects and related plan of financing are approved by the Board of Regents. We begin spending on the project using university cash and monitor that spending. <clears throat> at this point, we issue CP, but since the issuance had, has already been approved at the beginning of the process, we can literally pick up the phone, call our CP dealer, and tell them we need to issue more funds when they remarket the existing series of CP outstanding. That extra amount they issue is the amount we need to cover the recent spending. The proceeds are received and deposited in the custodian bank. The debt proceeds are then drawn from the bank account into our general account to reimburse ourselves. The total elapsed time under this process is closer to one to two months. Um, note that there will always be a lag since the amount we will issue is based on our spending and then we need approximately another month to support and document the actual draw from the custodian bank. When the projects are completed or we hit the maximum level um, issuance level, we will convert a portion of our CP to long-term debt. At this point, we would bring forward a formal resolution to issue debt that the board would approve. <coughs> we currently have $239 million in outstanding CP notes in series A through F issued from 2005 through 2017. With an approved maximum program size of 400 million, we could issue another 161 million, the difference between the 400 approved and the 239 outstanding. As a point of comparison, we have capital projects approved that have over $200 million in debt required as part of their financing plan. The list of those projects was identified on the docket sheet, page 51. So why are we recommending this approach? We have identified three goals, lower the overall cost of capital, increase our earnings on our cash, and add flexibility and nimbleness to our program. The amounts in the pie chart shown reflect our potential mix of debt by the end of fiscal 18. The 239 million of CP currently outstanding, which is variable rate debt, the 1.1 billion of fixed rate debt issued and outstanding, and again, this is at the end of 18, so it does reflect fiscal 18 payments on that debt, plus the refunding that we are currently um, underway, plus 161 million of debt to be issued for projects as fixed rate debt if we continue with our current process. That CP, which is variable, is 16% of the total pie, or our total portfolio, compared to an 84% fixed with an estimated weighted average cost of 2.9%. If instead we issue that 161 million as CP, our mix becomes 26% variable compared to 74% fixed, still an acceptable 
acceptable mix, but our weighted average cost drops to 2.6 percent, 28 basis points lower. And I do want to mention those um, weighted average cost looks lower than what we have shown you in the past few years, and that's because we are in the process of refunding about $300 million of our debt, uh, which were range from 3.8 percent to um, four and a half to even over five percent since some of this was issued back in 2009 when rates are higher and we're looking at uh, an all-in interest cost of 2.5 percent with the refunding so that alone has an impact on bringing our weighted average cost down Stuart? Uh, you, <coughs> excuse me you can see on slide 61 um, the difference in the, uh, first of all, Director uh, Fleck has mentioned that um, we use university cash currently to fund most of the construction projects and then that cash is refunded as we issue long-term debt. If in fact we use the commercial paper program uh, as the funding source, it leaves us with that additional cash that we can invest in TIP. Currently we're essentially borrowing from the TIP pool. Um, slide 61 indicates that the average yield on TIP uh, over a uh, recent time frame is uh, 105%. Uh, the cost of the exempt commercial paper over that same period on average is 26 basis points. So there's a spread of approximately 80 basis points. Uh, if we had the cash to, to reinvest, we could make 80 basis points in addition on that amount. If you took the 80 basis points times the 100, and essentially the 160 million of incremental uh, commercial paper that this program would allow us to issue, uh, you know that translates to uh, more than a million dollars a year of additional earnings in the tip pool. Uh, the squiggly lines in this chart uh, show the. Um, the yield and the commercial paper rate at various periods across uh, the time frame, but the spread remains approximately the same over that period. So in summary, the program offers the following advantages, a lower cost of capital, increased investment earnings, which can then be used to pay the interest expense on the CP during construction if we choose to do so. Financial flexibility and how quickly and efficiently we can obtain the financing and also having the ability to apply pledge gifts upon receipt against principal of the CP outstanding. And better balance sheet alignment by having short-term liabilities rather than long-term debt being aligned with the short-term assets supporting our debt. And though there are advantages, there are also risks identified with a program of this type which can be mitigated through different strategies. The counterparty risk is the risk that our CP dealer doesn't perform and doesn't remarket our notes. To mitigate that, we could hire a second CP dealer. The self-liquidity risk con are concerns that we are unable to maintain appropriate levels of assets to support our program. We only have a portion of the entire amount outstanding that might become due in the event that the notes are not remarketed by having maturity limitations built into our program. Right now, we only have, out of the total amount outstanding, only 50 million can mature in one day or 175 million in, per week. So therefore, should it happen that we, um, our dealer can't remarket our notes, it is not like we would have to have the full 239 million to come up with the cash to support um, those notes. Also, um, which we have done in the past and have not needed for our time being, we could go to a bank and add a line of credit for covering amounts that aren't remarketed to augment our liquidity if we should um, need it, kind of as a backup. And the interest rate risk, since CP is a variable rate, there is more volatility by having um, debt with this type and the interest rates could rise. Um, we can fix uh, CP relatively quickly since the debt has very short maturities and when we would fix it they would be considered current refundings and current refundings are not limited. So Chair Anderson, members of the committee were uh, here to answer questions or uh, engage you in any way that you'd like regarding this. I think our next steps would be that we would take your feedback uh, go back and see how your feedback impacts our plans and then come forward uh, in October with uh, formal uh, 
uh, either review or review an action depending upon your um, your intent. So with that, we're here for questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting. When, when we were going through the, uh, the agenda items and, and getting into this commercial paper and I started learning more about it, I, I really realized that you people are every day trying to figure out how we can do better at the university. And this is one of those things that potentially could could allow that. Um, I guess Regent Shu, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the presentation and express support for the program. I think any time we can reduce our cost of financing, uh, I think it's good for the university. My question is where do the savings, where would the savings accrue? Um, do they accrue to the project? So spend more on a particular project, for example, if we um, showed savings there. And then also uh, when we use our own cash, um, to finance projects early on, do we charge interest to the project? Uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Chu, uh, with respect to your first question, so we charge um, university departments for the cost of debt depending on who's financing the project and we do an average interest rate uh, calculation that we charge uh, units. So in effect, the owner of a project would yield uh, some savings through the debt, lower debt service. But in addition, because we pool it, uh, all participants in the debt pool would receive some incremental benefit as well. With respect to your second question, uh, could you repeat that for me? Uh, it was just, uh, you mentioned uh, that we tend to finance the early stages of a project with our own cash, mm -hmm. uh, but are we charging interest to the project when we do that or is it just kind of a zero? Thank you. Um, so currently we don't charge projects for con for financing during the construction phase. We don't start charging it really until we um, f put in place the debt plan, whatever that might be. Um, in this arrangement, what we would anticipate is because we are pulling in higher tip earnings into the tip pool. Um, as you know, tip earnings go into central reserves. We would have the opportunity to use those incremental additional savings to uh, finance that incremental interest rate cost during the construction phase. Even after that, there's a, there would be a net benefit to central reserves, so there would be more funds available in central reserves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Senior Vice President Burnett. Just, and to that point, Regent Hsu, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It really is the opportunity cost of loaning our cash out or using our cash as opposed to that upper line of earning what Stuart and his team can earn. And if we and and we can borrow quickly at a lower rate, we're we're giving up that opportunity cost of that gap. And even if it's a million dollars, I think it's worth the, the effort to go through it. We're we're seasoned in commercial paper. The rating agencies are comfortable. We've talked to them about this um, because they knew we were coming to talk with you all about it. But I think it really is about that opportunity cost we're losing of using our cash to finance projects and let's let's do it at the lowest cost possible. Great follow up. Uh, yeah thank you thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, the, I guess uh, the question that, that I forgot to ask is, is there a reason 400 is the maximum uh, proposed now or it, could it be higher? Senior Vice President Burnett. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Regent Shu. we think it, when you look at our balance sheet, that's the number that we feel comfortable with, starting with. Um, it's probably on the conservative side. Some would argue we could go even higher than 400, but when we're sitting on about 250 right now, we'd like to show performance on this before we would propose a higher number. I think in the future as the university gets bigger, it could be a bigger number, but we'd like to start with this 400 and we thought it was something that we could um, both service well and defend and manage w within the program and, and would meet our needs in the, in the next few years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Omari has a question. Thank you, Chair Anderson. And I think you, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I just wanna make sure I have it right. As I was reading the doc materials, even though 400 is the amount that, that we're going to go to, we have about 250 out now. When we met with the uh, credit agencies, they still put the full 400 on our books, even though we're not at that right now, which means that our credit rating will not be impacted if we max it at 400. Is that correct? Uh, Vice President Bolna. Yeah, Chair Anderson, Regent Amari, that's correct. So when we, when the board authorizes this program, the rating agencies will rate it and then subsequently look at our ratios 
as if that full 400 million were outstanding, just so that, I mean, that's a conservative approach that they take. Um, but as Carol and Senior Vice President Burnett have said, we, we talked to them about this just in the last week and a half, and uh, without sort of, you know, giving us a definitive answer, they were very comfortable with us proceeding uh, with a program like this. Perfect, thank you. We're now gonna hear from the banker, Regent BC. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. I just want to compliment Senior Vice President Burnett. This is a this is a um, program that he uh, worked with at a previous institution, was brought to the university, and our staff. Uh, we have had a commercial paper program, um, but this really makes our money work harder through this arbitraging of short-term uh, debt. So um, you can bring us one of these ideas every month or so. You'll be doing just fine. <laughs> I appreciate that, and, and when, when this was explained to me, I, one of the things I liked, and, and uh, Director Fleck, if you want to, you can, again, although you talked about mitigating the risks, it is not a type of deal like it's a hedge fund or anything like that. It's very straightforward, and that's what this university has right now with our both our investments and our, uh, our debt. We're very straightforward. Right. Is that, uh, do you want to comment on that? Regent Anderson, um, and what I had commented to him was, um, our last swap, our last hedging transaction that was still in place since 1997 matured uh, last week, the last week of August. So we have no hedging transactions. So our debt portfolio is very straightforward with the majority of fixed rate debt and some variable rate debt, which is very typical to have that mix. And as we've shown, it's still an acceptable mix, even issuing up to that 400 million at 26% variable. But th these are not fancy transactions. Thank you. We have any other uh, reasons for Mr. Chairman, real quickly, it, it seems to me in the risks that you listed there, the biggest risk is the uh, the interest rate change. At least to me, that's of the three you listed. That's the, uh, if interest rates go up, mm -hmm. which I think they might, but go up rather significantly, a half a point, a point, uh, you can just change CP debt to long-term debt and uh, like that. Dr. Uh, Fleck. Regent Stigma, and, and then I will also have Stuart can comment on this too. Um, it's probably not like this, but um, we do have to wait till the notes mature, and we would need board approval to issue long term debt. So there is that process, but yes, then it becomes a straightforward because we don't have to wait for long term maturities of the existing CP as we do in long term. In long term, you can't just pull that and pull that debt. With short term, you can because the maximum that's ever outstanding is 270 days, and most of our notes are only roll every 30 to 60 days. So, therefore, that's why we can do it quickly. It's just some of those other processes about getting approval and then going through the uh, long term pro process. Mr. Chairman, uh, you can do it in months, uh, in a couple of months. Yes, that is correct. Vice President uh, Mason, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I just wanted to clarify what. what uh, Director Fleck said um, uh, th there is a process of approval by the regents um, and then issuing of long-term debt, and that whole process it itself can take uh, two or three months. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, interest rates, uh, you know, they're not spiking in 30 days. They are gradually progressing one way or another. Um, they have been low for long, and, you know, while we all expect them to rise, uh, in the future, I think we will have an opportunity to react uh, when we see that trend emerging and change the mix of of the short-term debt um, as is appropriate at the time. Thank you. Uh, Senior Vice President Burnett. And Regents Fagum and members of the board, uh, just to let you know, as we head into next week, uh, issuing the debt you've already authorized and refinancing the debt that uh, they just described, um, some of the regions um, may be aware we had our credit rating of AA1 and, and AA uh, both sustained by Moody's and Standard & Poor's heading into this bond issuance. So uh, stable outlook from both rating agencies uh, we, and we expect a, a good, hopefully a really good result next week. We may be very lucky, bet, better lucky than good next week with where interest rates are right now. So um, uh, again, you should uh, understand that the, the prior decisions, good stewardship of this institution have led us to be very, very credit worthy in the market and drive that cost of capital as low as possible. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you, people. Uh, as we change the 
table, our, our next program, our next discussion item, the review will be an update to the asset allocation guidelines. Uh, Vice President Mason, you can stay seated evidently. Uh, Senior Director Parks and, and Senior Vice President uh, Burnett are gonna lead us on that. And I guess uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, when you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board and, and student representatives. Uh, the Office of Investments and Banking in conjunction with our Investment Advisory Committee and an outside consultant have spent the past nine months evaluating our asset allocation guidelines that are in an appendix to the region's policy and endowment. They have developed and are recommending changes to the asset allocation framework that are intended to improve the likelihood of achieving our primary investment goal established by the regions, which is to maintain the in inflation adjusted value of the endowment for future generations. Before that, Mr. Mason's going to take a few minutes to hit the highlights of our annual mass asset management report and to show the investment performance on various portfolios under management and to give you context to the current asset allocation framework which will change if this recommendation is adopted. Today is just about review. Action would be at a future meeting. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, happy to have these. Go ahead, gentlemen. Provide. Uh, thank you all. Uh, if I could uh, indulge you to turn to the annual asset management report, which in your docket materials is page 102. I'd like to, as Senior Vice President Burnett mentioned, give a little bit of context to the discussion we'd like to have with you about changing the asset allocation uh, framework. Um, on page 102, just, just as a level setting exercise for those who have not sat in on some of the finance committee meetings previously or who may be uh, newer to the board, uh, I just wanted to make it very clear what we're talking about when we get into the asset allocation uh, framework discussion. On page 102, you see the assets that are managed by the Office of Investments and Banking. The top line there is the Consolidated Endowment Fund, which is really the focus of the discussion today. It's a billion 350. I want to be clear that it is very distinctly different from the $2.15 billion that the foundation manages, which they also call a, an endowment. If you put those two pools of capital together, the university has in endowed funds approximately three and a half billion and within the uh, Big Ten, uh, just, to, just to put in context, uh, uh, Michigan and Northwestern have something in the range of 10 to 12 billion. Uh, Ohio State and Penn State have approximately 4 billion. And we would be fifth uh, in the Big Ten with our three and a half combined. Uh, the, the foundation assets are managed very separately. They have a different asset allocation, a different strategy, and that is derived from a different set of liabilities and a different way of managing funds uh, than what we're going to discuss with you uh, a little bit later this morning. You can also see on this page uh, the other assets that are managed in the Office of Investments and Banking that in total get to 2.6 billion. Uh, not mentioned here are the $5 billion in, in uh, retirement assets that we have some uh, direct oversight of and governance uh, surrounding. Uh, the, on the next page, hardwired into the Regents policy is the goal of preserving inflation adjusted value for the endowment. I want to, want to be clear what that actually means. Uh, this means that uh, we pay out 4.5% to the university uh, in distributions to fund the various programs that the endowments are set up to do. We pay out 4.5% annually. We charge the endowment approximately 50 basis points more, or half a, half a percent more, to, um, for expenses, uh, for some support to the foundation uh, fundraising efforts, and other expenses. So 4.5% goes out, another 50 basis points goes out. And in order to keep the endowment funding the same programs year after year, we have to not only replace that 5% each year, but we have to replace more of it as it relates to the inflation uh, creep of higher cost. So uh, inflation is approximately 25 2.4, 2.5% over long periods of time. We walk around the office saying to ourselves, 5% plus inflation is a 7.5% target annually. Um, so how have we done? Uh, the next page would indicate that a, uh, 
uh, portfolio of 70-30 stocks and bonds over a, the 15-year period since the Office of Investments and Banking was established has produced 7.5%. Uh, so we've met the, the, the primary regent's goal of inflation adjusted. Um, the actual performance because of the asset allocation and some strategic moves that we have made periodically uh, have produced uh, an actual return of 8.1% over that period of time. The increment is approximately $200 million of excess funds that have been added during the period uh, that we're talking about. The next page is really the context, provides context for the uh, asset allocation discussion. Uh, you can see from the pie chart on the left the current actual allocation. This framework was established seven or eight years ago the last time we did the study, and it is a very traditional asset allocation uh, derived from a mean variance optimization model where we try to balance various types of um, asset types um, or asset classes and vehicle types. So there's hedge funds in the absolute return bucket, there's real estate in the real asset bucket, there's private equity, public equity, uh, etc. And in a market where stocks have been up fairly significantly and bonds have been up fairly significantly, this framework has worked very well for us as the previous slide indicated. The conversation that we're going to have shortly will change this asset allocation framework to something that we think is more workable in the current uh, capital markets environment. Just one last comment, uh, performance for the year, uh, we came in at 10.7% um, this year compared to an internal benchmark of 10.9%. Um, we would have made the 10.9 or 11% had we not uh, executed a sale of some private assets, approximately 85 million of private assets during the course of the year at a very small discount, um, which uh, reduced our return by approximately 30 basis points for the year. We undertook that transaction to give us some more liquidity and flexibility to reinvest in higher returning assets um, over the long term. Uh, and you, you can see the, the various return uh, profile here over the course of uh, time frames. One last comment on the, on the next page, you'll see that uh, the return drivers over the course of this period have really been the, um, the equity, this is public equity on the far left-hand side or the private equity and venture capital on the far, excuse me, first public equity is left-hand side, public equity is on the right-hand side. Those are really the two drivers that that produce a majority of the return in the, um, in the portfolio. The asset classes in the middle, uh, the purpose that they serve for us is some diversification in return, some stability, providing some stability in the return, and in some cases providing liquidity during periods when uh, we choose not to sell uh, or could not sell uh, the equity uh, portions of the portfolio. So I, I provide that as uh, background to the discussion about asset allocation. Is there any questions on the asset management report before we move to the, uh, the heart of the batting order here this morning? It looks like my colleagues are fine. You can yep. keep proceeding. Good. Um, so uh, by way of introduction uh, to asset allocation uh, framework discussion, uh, we've spent as Regent uh, excuse me, as uh, Senior Vice President Burnett mentioned, we spent the last nine months with the Investment Advisory Committee in consultation with the President and others uh, over changes in the asset allocation that might be more suitable to the current capital markets environment. I'm sure all of you are aware when you read in the newspaper that um, uh, stock markets are at all-time highs, Japanese market, the U.S. market, uh, the, the global uh, capital equity markets uh, are reaching peaks. Uh, bond markets, uh, uh, when, when interest rates fall, as they have over the last decade, bond prices rise. So similarly, the bond prices are at all-time highs um, and not expected to rise much further, uh, particularly if there's a rising rate in environment. So we're facing a very different environment today than we did a decade ago or 15 years ago. Uh, there are pretty significant headwinds. And as a result, all of the assumptions about how much both stocks and bonds can earn in the next decade, or next generation for that matter, uh, have been reduced pretty significantly. Uh, 
10 years or 15 years ago, it was pretty easy to put together a portfolio of stocks and bonds. When stocks are in 10 or 12 and bonds are in six or seven, you could easily get to the seven and a half percent, which is our target. And in fact, you know, as you saw, we achieved uh, slightly over 8% during that period. Today, when stocks are forecast to, to return 5 or 6% and bonds 2 or 3%, it's a lot harder to put together a portfolio of stocks and bonds and get to the objectives, um, which, which is our goal. Um, page 71 of the material uh, is a reiteration of the, the goal for the regents. Um, uh, the, the goal is typically is is as I stated earlier five percent uh, plus uh, inflation. Uh, we've talked about the build up um, to that. Uh, page seventy two is a schematic of the new asset allocation framework that we are uh, proposing. The new uh, the new format is really divided into three categories, not the former six categories. And we have described this as purpose-driven asset allocation framework. The reason for the description is um, we have divided the uh, asset allocation into three larger buckets, each which has a specific purpose. So we would propose abandoning the asset class and the asset type, security type, structure and, and um, make larger collections of assets where our goal would be or our, our objective would be to pool different kinds of assets that have the same purpose against the long-term objectives, pool them together and then make relative value dis uh, decisions about which is the better one and which one, as we add a new asset or a new investment, which one is more likely to achieve uh, the goals and objectives of that particular um, uh, portion of the endowment. You can see there's three buckets. The stability bucket, uh, the range we're proposing is 5 to 15 percent. We're going to elaborate a little on each of these uh, in the next couple of slides. This is really the safety net. We spent a lot of time thinking about how much uh, liquidity and how much safety net we really need to support uh, the goals and objectives of the university. Um, and this would end up being high grade fixed income and treasury securities primarily. The next is a diversifiers bucket, which is uncorrelated to, uh, these, are, these would be investments uncorrelated to or not at all similar to the growth assets that we saw in one of the previous slides. Uh, so this is uncorrelated to uh, equity markets uncorrelated to the private equity and venture return profiles that are the real drivers of return, but still maintain a sufficient return to be additive to the overall um, uh, growth of the portfolio. And the third bucket is a growth bucket, and it is designed to be investments that are facing GDP growth, global growth, earnings per share growth, um, or other, other factors that represent higher growth um, characteristics in the capital markets. So this is clearly public equity, private equity, venture capital, and a number of other uh, growthy um, elements in the, in the capital markets. Uh, so when we started the, the process of review, reviewing the asset allocation framework, the, uh, the, the first step is really to make sure that we understand our objectives and then um, conduct a thorough assessment and review of what the stumbling blocks are that might get in the way of meeting those objectives. And um, what we did was we assessed roughly 30 different measures of risk across um, investor statistical and, and asset specific uh, metrics. Um, we have a subset of those included uh, below. But, but really, in its simplest form, the tension that we face is the tension between uh, being too aggressive and, and being too conservative. So if we're too aggressive, we run the risk of permanent impairment of capital or some sort of other programmatic uh, you know, issues. If we're too conservative, as Stuart alluded to, we, we run the risk of not being able to meet our objectives of, of CPI plus five. And so what we, what we want to discuss in the next three pages um, is, is two different risk factors um, that reside on each end of those spectrums. So too, too defensive versus too 
offensive. Um, too defensive being the issue of how do we figure out how we get to CPI plus five. Too aggressive being um, how do we think about uh, liquidity management given some of the levers that we want to pull. Um, before doing that, we, we thought it would at least be instructive to comment on some of the risks that didn't float to the, to the top of that list. Um, one of them being the, the volatility of returns. Uh, volatility is most often referred to or looked at as the primary measure of risk. We think it's uh, somewhat of a, a poor measure, frankly, for a variety of reasons. But um, when we think about risk tolerance, it's worth thinking about it in, in the perspective of uh, ability to tolerate risk and willingness to tolerate risk. Um, the, the ability is more uh, structural, the, will, the willingness is a little bit more behavioral, but on the structural side, it's worth uh, going back to some of Stuart's comments about the, uh, the four and a half percent payout that, that, we, that, that we make out of the endowment. That four and a half percent is actually applied to a 60-month uh, smooth number. So that's over five years. We, excuse me, we've, uh, we smooth out the, um, the value of the endowment. And what that means is that in any um, short-term period, if there's a meaningful amount of volatility, that doesn't have a big impact on the English department's budget for, for their endowment, for example. And so um, that gives us a more of an ability to, to tolerate risk. In addition, um, when we look at totality of the, the payout from the endowment, the 4.5%, I believe comprises something like 1.8% of the total operating budget of the university. So uh, counter to a lot of our other peers, uh, that, that payout is, is less meaningful and um, one that, that gives us a, a bit more flexibility. Um, another one which, which some people might take exception with, but we'll, we'll call out is the issue of performance versus peers. Um, you'll see that listed toward the bottom of our, our list of concerns. You know, frankly, we report those numbers because people ask, but there's not a single thing that we do in our office that's trying to figure out how we can overweight or underweight something else relative to our peers. Um, our objective every day is to focus on CPI plus five, um, and if we happen to beat our peers, that's that's extra gravy in our minds, but um, happens to be the last four years that we've been top quartile, and we're certainly pleased about that, but um, we know that uh, a portion of that is due to some success in uh, some of the liquid strategies that have uh, a lumpiness of their returns, and so um, we feel very confident that if we're sitting in front of you in two years and we're not top quartile, but you know below median, we would still feel like if we're executing this strategy effectively, we're you know we, we'd be we'd be happy. Um, so so going to to the next page and talking a little bit about the levers that we think we can pull in a low return environment to increase the probability of, of generating CPI plus five. Uh, we spent a lot of time with the Investment Advisory Committee talking about um, really developing a heat map around these different levers. And what we talked about was the, the, the road is wide, but the path is narrow, meaning that there are a lot of different levers that we can pull, uh, some more prudent to employ than others. And um, a few that we rejected, for example, one would be just to de-risk and, and, and really take a pre preservation of capital mindset, um, which is tempting to do given all of the kind of macroeconomic conditions that Stuart alluded to and the fact that we're pretty you know, late cycle both from a business and credit perspective. Um, we, we think that's imprudent given our, our return expectations and our, our long-term time horizon. Um, what we ultimately did land on uh, was, was first off increasing alternative strategies. Uh, if you think back to the pie chart that Stuart walked through, um, roughly 55% of the fund today is in traditional equity and fixed income strategies. Uh, if you add hedge funds to that, which are uh, mostly liquid within a year, that, that gets us to about 65%. Uh, so really, there's around 35% in what we would refer to as alternative strategies, like private equity and, and, and venture capital. Um, philosophically, we have a belief in um, the efficacy of these strategies, the ability to generate excess returns from them, um, and the reason why our performance for the last handful of years has been strong, as, as I mentioned, is because these strategies have, have delivered. Um, and so what we've looked at is a, a framework in which we can, can increase that exposure uh, by roughly 8 to 10 percent, um, which we think will, uh, will be beneficial over the long term. The, the second and third levers of enhanced diversification and pursuit idiosyncratic opportunities um, are related. Uh, there's, there's an adage in finance that diversification is the only free lunch, and we, we believe in that to a, to a certain extent, and I think it's, it's something that's embedded in this recommendation um, that we want to pursue um, a, a little bit more diversification across geographies, across strategy types, et, et cetera. Um, and one of the more diversifying strategies you can find is something that's idiosyncratic, so something that doesn't zig or zag along with, with the public markets. Um, and so we're, we're pursuing those, uh, those strategies as well. 
Um, all in is, and, and we'll show this towards the back end of the, the deck, but we think pulling these levers would lead to an improvement of roughly 50 basis points in expected return over the, the medium term horizon. Um, our internal underwriting assumptions, which are a little bit more um, aggressive, would suggest we could potentially do somewhere closer to 125 to 150 basis points above that. And so, you know, we think the, the impact from successfully executing this could be meaningful enough and, and certainly worth pursuing. Um, Lastly, the, the, one of the areas of focus for us is ensuring that we have enough liquidity and dry powder on hand. Um, we think today we have that. We've been um, continually implementing some efforts to, to ensure that. Uh, but I think Stuart's going to comment on the next page about um, some of our thinking on that. So if you turn to the next page, uh, after uh, assessing the risk uh, and uh, some of the related issues that Andrew just discussed, the next step for us is figure out what the safety net is. Uh, so we undertook a process of bottoms up evaluation of uh, the liquidity requirement and the size of the safety net that would be necessary before we started the fundamental balancing of some of the more risky assets that are going to generate return. Um, so that's the stability bucket, uh, which I uh, referenced um, in my earlier remarks. The purpose of this bucket, uh, as you can see uh, from the step chart here, is uh, first of all evaluating uh, the operational needs of the university. Slide. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, first of all, evaluating the operational needs. So this two and a half percent uh, of the of the stability, uh, two and a half percent of the overall fund. Um, is really six to nine months of our payout distribution. So we can go for that period of time by drawing on this capital um, to make the distributions and not have that portion of our responsibility be at risk. The, the next thing that the liquidity bucket or the stability bucket um, really covers is uh, the capital calls that we have from our private funds. So we forecast on an annual basis the amount of capital that's going to be drawn by commitments that we've made for long-term uh, investment partnerships. And in this case, we have budgeted uh, four to six months worth of those capital calls in near-term liquidity. Um, the third portion of this is dry powder. This is undesignated, but if the capital markets are in disarray and equity markets are declining as uh, they have periodically uh, in the past, we want to be positioned to, with dry powder and liquidity to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, so all of this stability bucket is designed to make sure that we do not have to sell assets that are distressed, that we don't have to sell equity uh, when equity is declining, and we'll have a ready source of cash or near cash to take advantage of opportunity and fund our, our obligations. We've We've sized this bucket at 5 to 15% of the overall for a range with a target of 8%, which is the result of the buildup that I've, I've just described. The 8% will be invested in uh, cash, in short-term treasuries, uh, and in high, a small amount in high-grade fixed income. And in total, this, what the 8% would represent today about 100 and somewhere between 100 and $125 million of uh, liquidity in the portfolio. So you can think of what Stuart described as the liquidity floor. Uh, the next step in, in the process was to think about what the illiquidity ceiling might be. And so what we did there was to think about um, how might different levels of commitment pacing to some of these illiquid strategies uh, be impacted by different market environments. And um, the reality is it's somewhat of an uh, inexact science, and there's a lot of things that are outside of our control in terms of what happens to the, to the public markets, how quickly our existing managers either call capital or return capital to us. Um, but a few things that we, we set out to accomplish. One is we really want to make sure that we have what's referred to as vintage year diversification, which just means that we don't have a big, lumpy uh, portion of capital that get, gets committed in one, um, one specific year. We want to smooth that out over time so that we're not 
uh, making any sort of unintentional bet. Um, the second piece, which was really crucial for us, is we wanted to ensure uh, that, that even in stress periods, we had the ability to commit enough capital, which mathematically we said is 50% of our, our target allotment, um, to strategies that we have either high conviction in or that we think are attractive given um, potentially a, a distress cycle. One of the reasons why that's so important for us is because a lot of the strategies that we, we commit capital to are with managers who have no shortage of folks like us who are willing to give them money. And um, if you miss a, a fundraise, um, sometimes that means you don't get invited back to the next one. And so, especially in the venture capital side of the portfolio. Um, and so for us, that's a, just a programmatic issue that we wanted to be, be quite sensitive to. And so um, this, is just a, this visual is just a snapshot of how some of the modeling played out over different market environments. Um, I'll note that that extreme dislocation uh, scenario is, is about as draconian as it gets. So it's, uh, uh, I think, a 36% drawdown in, in everything across the board minus fixed income with no real recovery for up to five years. And so um, you look at the global financial crisis, which was similar to that in one year, but then a, a nice sharp, sharp rally starting in 2009. Um, even in those scenarios, we don't see our, our private market um, range getting to be above 50-ish percent. Um, and so we think a, a more dynamic approach to committing capital um, that's aware of some of these, these sensitivities is appropriate, but uh, leads us to, to, to have a target of something around 45% in, in, in liquid strategies. Um, the, so this is the next step in the process once we establish that liquidity floor and the illiquidity ceiling is just to start building the buckets. And, um, there are a lot of different methodologies and frameworks around how to do asset allocation. Um, we, we went into a little bit of color in the docket cover memo on, on that, and we'll, we'll um, not go through some of the pros and cons, either academically or, or theoretically, on some of those. But um, as Stuart mentioned, we, uh, we, we landed on a lot of comfort around this purpose-driven framework, um, primarily because... Um, it, it, it forces us as investors to really think through what is the purpose, what is the objective of the strategy we're using, um, not to, to focus too much on what the vehicle type is or what the asset class is that it might be um, housed in. And so um, an example that I think we gave to this to, to, to the Finance uh, Committee of the Board back in May when we teed this up is, is hedge funds. Um, saying that you're invested in a hedge fund says absolutely nothing about the underlying risk and return profile of that strategy. It's just a vehicle type and a legal structure. Uh, the parallel to think about is the, the 401A that we offer employees here at the university. If someone says they're in a 401A, that just means that they have a tax shelter to their retirement assets. It doesn't tell you anything about whether they're 100% in stocks or 100% in, in, in bonds. And so um, for us, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be much more thoughtful and much more intentional about how we we categorize strategies and think about relative value assessment across strategies. And that's, that's really what gave us comfort around, around this framework. Um, if, if we look at page uh, 78, uh, the, the, the first bucket that we, we formed after the stability bucket was the, the diversifiers bucket, um, which you'll see, uh, again, a snapshot of. The, the objective is to deliver returns that are in line with our, our total fund objectives of inflation plus 5%, but to do it through strategies that do not have as much exposure to traditional equity and fixed income markets. Uh, you'll see that the... There are three buckets, idiosyncratic, enhanced stability, and growth diversifiers. Um, the, the purpose in totality is to ensure that we're not a one-trick pony, so that we're not in a situation where when growth is doing well, when equity markets are rallying, everything is fine. If that, that is not the case and the returns are as middling as, as the capital market uh, expectations would suggest, um, that we still have other levers and other multiple ways to win. Um, so the, the, uh, the first bucket of idiosyncratic is predominantly likely to be um, uh, to, to include hedge fund strategies that don't have a, a persistent um, equity or credit beta to it. Beta is just an academic term for how much market sensitivity a strategy has. Um, these are largely skill-based strategies, and you'll see that the lower bound for that, that range would be zero because... Um, skill uh, and the ability to make money on that skill is not something that we feel like we need to have a persistent allocation to, but would, would only be um, used if we, we felt high conviction in it. Um, we've actually been somewhat skeptical of, of hedge funds and have been reducing our allocation there as of late, in part because of the, the fee load associated with them and um, the lack of, of return potential. Uh, 
Enhanced stability you can think of as being mostly associated with public and private lending strategies that are very senior in the capital structure. Um, we had spoken to the board about some changes that were made to the policies around the, the TIP portfolio that allowed for one of these strategies, for example, um, that, that, that uh, gives loans to middle market companies in the U.S. at LIBOR plus 5 or 6% um, with very good credit profiles. So these are things that are, um, again, more, more secure even in downturns. Um, and then lastly, growth diversifiers is a bit of a catch-all, but largely uh, would include either niche, counter-cyclical, or inflation-sensitive strategies that um, have a little bit more octane to them. So we would expect them to generate returns uh, similar to, if not in excess, of, of equities, uh, but again, to have different drivers of, of those returns. Uh, as we see on page uh, 79, uh, this is just a schematic of how we, we think about constructing the growth bucket. Um, again, this would be the work, workhorse for the portfolio. The target is, is roughly 62% um, with a range of 50 to 70. And the, the, the one constant over time is that being exposed to growth is, is um, the clearest path to, to wealth creation and is the one exposure that we feel like the portfolio has to have. Um, if we look at the, the matrix below, what we're trying to um, kind of underpin is the notion that the, the way we'd think about structuring it is with an awareness that equity is equity. So again, whether it's public equity, private equity, uh, equity that's within a hedge fund, um, we wanna have the flexibility to look across geographies and look across vehicle types and really put the onus on us to determine where it's best to employ capital. Um, a, good, a good example of that would be in the emerging markets. If you think about um, a desire to have exposure to the rising middle class consumer, for example, um, if you look at doing that through the passive uh, emerging markets index, that index is roughly 60% in either IT or financials. Um, so when you think about the uh, healthcare industry, the consumer uh, discretionary or consumer staples industries, those are less than 20% collectively of that index, and those are the, the segments that we could actually get exposure to through the private markets that we think would be um, you know, better suited to exploit those types of opportunities. And so. Um, Really the question, the, the two questions we would ask ourselves for each of these geographies would be, how efficient is the public market? Um, if the answer is it's, it's quite efficient, then we would likely not have much in active management and would choose to just implement cost effectively through, through passive means. In the US large cap space, for example, that, that would be our, our philosophy. Um, the second question would be how um, sizable and persistent do we think the illiquidity premium is that we can garner in, in the private markets? Um, we, we see a lot of good opportunity in venture capital in the U.S., good opportunities in um, emerging markets as well, um, but we need to be convinced that we can generate a few hundred basis points above public markets in order to, to lock up our capital. Um, you'll notice on the, the, the top row here we have a, a geographic mix of 45% to U.S., 30% to develop, and 25% and to emerging markets. Uh, if you look at slide 80, we have uh, just a... a and some data to put some context around that recommendation. Um, from, from a long-term strategic asset allocation perspective, the goal is, is really to set out um, uh, what is really the sandbox, what is the opportunity set that we think is available to us as institutional investors who can, can access both the public and private markets. And where we landed was, was roughly 45% U.S., as I said, 30% developed, 25% emerging. And what that reflects is a couple things. One is it, it does reflect our, our viewpoint that while the emerging markets are likely to be volatile, um, we think they are one of the better opportunities to find growth and also one of the better opportunities to find excess return. Um, it also reflects our belief in diversification in that um, over the last handful of years, if you've been US-centric, you've been pretty happy with it because it's outperformed most, most global markets, but that's not necessarily gonna be the gift that always keeps on giving, and so we, we wanna be um, thoughtful about being diversified globally, and we think that this mix uh, strikes that right balance. So, um, when, when you put together the, the the growth bucket with the diversifiers bucket, really the themes that are embedded in both the, the the sizing relative to each other, and then the composition of them is growth for the long run. Um, make sure we have good diversification and find attractive opportunities to exploit the illiquidity uh, premium where we can. So. Um, that, that's really the strategy in a nutshell, and I think uh, Stuart was going to talk a little bit about how that differs from how we're positioned today. Yeah, so I've got a couple of slides to wrap up uh, that are summary in nature. Uh, first of all, I want to answer the question, so how is this different from what we currently have? 
And you can see on the far right-hand side the actual weight, the changes in actual weights from the proposed target. So the, the stability bucket, the first one that we talked about uh, that provides liquidity is, uh, target is 8%, and that would be approximately 5% less than what we currently have in the existing portfolio. Um, there are minor, somewhat minor changes in most of the rest of the uh, sub-portfolios, as you can see, but where does that 5% that is currently in relatively safe fixed income, where does it uh, go? And I would suggest that it goes to two other places. It goes to two other types of fixed income. Uh, it goes to the en enhanced stability bucket, where there's a plus four, and enhanced stability um, is really just higher earning, but still relatively safe fixed income. It's structured credit, it's senior bank loans, it could be uh, real estate, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, debt to core real estate, but instead of earning the 2% uh, uh, or so, which we would expect the stability bucket to earn, uh, our expectation on the uh, enhanced stability bucket fixed income would be more like uh, five or maybe 6%. So it, it's still in fixed income. The, the last of those five percentage points of decline um, really goes to the lowest bucket, the extended credit bucket, which is higher yielding fixed income. Granted, this is a little bit more risky fixed income. It can be the sovereign debt of, of um, uh, emerging markets, or it might be uh, Euro bank loan portfolios, things of that nature where the uh, earnings expectation is more like 7 or 8%. The other changes within these buckets are relatively minor, uh, I would submit. So uh, while this, we're thinking about this framework as a different construct and a different way of progressing, I think the transition to the new format uh, 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 assuming it's, it, it's approved, um, is not a very dramatic change from uh, what we currently uh, have in place. Um, a couple of the benefits uh, are, are illustrated on this next page. Uh, as Andrew mentioned earlier, I think the return expectation for the new uh, framework goes up by about 50 basis points. The volatility of the return stays about the same. Uh, at 13.5, 13.4%, which is a pretty normalized uh, volatility profile of a uh, equity-oriented uh, portfolio such as ours. The probability of achieving uh, CPI plus 5%, which is, is the uh, core objective, um, goes up moderately. Uh, with the current uh, portfolio, it's really a coin flip at 50-50. And uh, we've managed to uh, be on the positive side of that over the last several years. But the, uh, the new format, we think, increases slightly uh, the likelihood of uh, maintaining our uh, ability to, uh, to uh, achieve that goal. And the 10-year shortfall risk is a little bit of an esoteric concept uh, in our world, but the current portfolio is structured to essentially break even or lose $20 million over the course of a 10-year period of time in its attempt to keep up with the CPI plus five. The new format, if we run it through the same modeling procedure, ends up uh, producing an additional uh, $100 million of excess return, which is really the difference in the 7.4 and 7.9% uh, return expectation. So in summary, um, in the last page, what we are uh, proposing and are asking at some point in, in future meeting we'll ask for your approval for is a, a change in the asset allocation structure to have three large buckets, a stability, a diversifiers, and growth buckets with the ranges that you see here, and further subdivided into um, the profile in the gray buckets of, of the various components of each of those three. In addition, having targets for the equity bucket, or the, excuse me, the growth bucket, uh, or the equity portion of the growth bucket um, of 45% U.S., 30% developed, and 25% emerging markets as targets um, for the equity exposure in those buckets. Uh, and I think that concludes our presentation. We'll certainly uh, welcome questions. Thank you very much, Vice President Mason and, and Director Parks. That was that was a lot in about 40 minutes, and uh, it, it's it's fun to see that you guys are really interested in the subject. I'm glad to see that. I, uh, <laughs>
I'm every, ready to go every, talk to my 401 K advisor right now. So, so there's a new motto around campus called "Row the boat." Row the boat. Every day we show up at work thinking, "Grow the boat." <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great model for the uh, endowment group. Uh, we're gonna, we have plenty of time for some questions here. Uh, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, <clears throat> looks very interesting. Uh, my question, my first question is, what? Uh, why is it that you need to come back and ask us uh, to change um, in, you know, or approve a change in this exactly? Because what I'm looking at uh, in your summary is that you're not really changing what you're doing. You're just changing kind of how you explain what you're doing in terms of you know taking the uh, asset allocation and changing some of the um, maybe the uh, groupings and the buckets. So that's my first question. And you know, if I look at the, just a comment, if I look at what you're doing um, at the high level, you've got three buckets, but you really have nine buckets underneath those three. And you're showing us, um, you're showing us what you're doing in the nine buckets and how it kind of uh, rolls up into the three buckets. And if you look at the three buckets, um, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't look like you're asking us to and maybe you are asking us to actually say that stability needs to be 5 to 15 and diversifiers 20 to 40 and growth 50 to 70. But I'm not sure how we would ever know if that was actually happening because you don't always report that uh, port to us at that level of detail. So mm -hmm. does that make Vice President Mason? Yeah. Uh, Chair Anderson, uh, Regent Chu, and committee. Um, this does, re uh, so first of all, the asset allocation framework that uh, the current asset allocation framework, which we showed in that pie chart at the very beginning of the discussion, is part of a resolution, or excuse me, part of a, uh, an amendment to the region's policy. So there, the region's policy outlines how we invest in some parameters around liquidity and put some very specific uh, targets and limits in the policy. And attached to that is a resolution that describes the six different buckets currently with ranges around them. So while this is, does not represent a change in the policy per se, it will represent, we, we are asking to have a different, a resolution to change the amendment. So the amendment would state, and somewhere in your, in your uh, I, I think on page 69 of the uh, Regents materials, the DACA materials would be a resolution with the new framework described. And you could see there, uh, if you were to turn to that page, the three stability diversifiers and growth buckets with ranges, and then the sub buckets or sub portfolios described with the relative ranges um, as we've discussed. So we are asking for a resolution, or we'll be asking for approval of a resolution to change the formal structure of the asset allocation. Regent Chu, your, your second question. Um, in the mix of quarterly reports and certainly in the annual report, uh, we do try to highlight where we are actual in terms of allocation relative to the targets. So that pie chart in our annual report, for example, is a report of actual, uh, alongside of it shows the variances from the, uh, within the targets. And so we do, and, and internally we keep track of this on a daily basis as we are rebalancing or reallocating assets with the cash flows that are coming in and coming out. Thank you. Did you see Hello. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So what you're saying is that on a, even on a daily basis, you are going to be maintaining um, or be within these parameters that you're asking us to approve? Our, our, on, a, on a daily basis, we uh, or on a weekly basis, more practically speaking, we look at these uh, ranges and we rebalance into these ranges. Um, not every asset class is within our control completely, so we are making commitments to private capital uh, structures that have, in many cases, a 10-year uh, time horizon, and predicting the cash flows in those is, while we do a relatively decent job, is not always an exact science. So, for example, in the current region's policy, there is a limitation of 40% in private capital um, partnerships. There have been periods of time over the last uh, 15 years when we have been above 40 percent. 
not by choice but by virtue of changes elsewhere in the portfolio and we are obligated to report that to you in our quarterly reports and we have done that. Today we are at about 35 percent which is within the 30 to 40 percent range in the policy currently. Just one more. Thank you, Regent. I would just add uh, briefly, the, um, the another consideration to keep in mind is that the um, once the strategic asset allocation framework were to be improved, uh, we would be working internally and with the Investment Advisory Committee to develop a roughly three to five year transition plan. Um, a lot of the changes that would be made um, in the public markets could be affected quite quite quick, quickly, but we do not uh, want to um, you know, do anything to um, you know to a herky jerky in nature. And so the idea is to judiciously transition from where we're at to to the new structure. And so the the, the ranges have to be a little bit flexible given given that timeline. Thank you. Okay, and just one final. Thank you, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to clarify, you wouldn't if if there were a need if the markets went um, down significantly, there wouldn't be a need for you to come to us and say, hey, we need to be in cash tomorrow or next week, because um, that would not be. You know, within your model, but you could do that. Uh, we we might choose to raise cash by selling certain assets um, to replenish the stability bucket, for example. But that isn't something um, that we would come to the regions okay. for uh, um, permission to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent McMillan. Please. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, Three thoughts here. First of all, Director Parks and Vice President Mason, a uh, thoughtful, analytical, comprehensive assessment that I think provides a superb basis for us to go forward and you know rationally consider this change. So, so thank you for that, and uh, appreciate the depth and you know scope of the analysis that you're putting in front of us. Two, and then the last two thoughts here. One, I'd, I'd ask perhaps Regent uh, Beeson to comment, uh, or one of you, or both of you, on the Investment Advisory Committee's views of all this, because that's an amazing resource that we're, uh, we're gifted with. And secondly, perhaps uh, you, Vice President Mason, or perhaps uh, the Senior Vice President, or even the President, how does this framework, if it does at all, set us up to deal with the steady the steady diet of social influences on the portfolio that we will see over time. I don't know that it, it makes a difference, but I'm curious what you think about that. So perhaps Regent Beeson and then Vice President Mason, if mm -hmm. I might, Chair Anderson. You, you, uh, you're becoming a mind reader. I had Regent Beeson next to speak, so we'll, we'll just go ahead, Regent Beeson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Regent uh, McMillan. I'm, I'm pleased and to be able to talk about um, the Investment Advisory Committee. Um, that it's an important structure in this um, in this business uh, because this is uh, this is high finance, and we do have the benefit of six of the best money managers in in Minnesota who volunteer their time orderly, and watching part of the job as a regent on that committee is watching that dynamic between those people and our staff. And there's push, and there's questioning, and the you know the opportunities to make money and be above market are never obvious or apparent. This requires a lot of research, and a key part is picking the fund managers correctly and managing them or terminating them. And so, as a as a regent, and I've wrapped up my two years, and I hope uh, one of you ha will be able to participate in this. Um, is there that is a healthy tension that goes on? Um, with those members and our staff, and, and and at the end of the day, our staffs demonstrated the ability to produce a strong return. So I think uh, this proposal is is uh, is reasonable to uh, have going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, Vice President mm -hmm. Mason, and Director Parks, did you want to comment any on uh, Regent McMillan's other questions? You know, I, I think the, you can remember them. Uh, oh no, uh, of course. Uh, uh, on the social social related issue, I, I think social responsibility and environmental uh, sensitivity and so forth permeate um, really everything we do, and we we encounter uh, those issues when we're doing due diligence on on many of our managers. The really excellent top performing managers today have thematically made that part of the way they do business. 
corporations that uh, we're investing in from a stock or a bond point, point, point of view. The successful ones have incorporated that in the way they do business. But as far as our uh, diligence efforts, it's one of the themes that we we explore with them. We want to make sure that our managers are sensitive to some of those issues and looking for the best, uh, most sustainable kinds of investments to make within the in the purview of what they do. An example of that would be one of our um, large cap U.S. Uh, or excuse me, uh, one of our large cap global stock managers um, has eliminated virtually all of the uh, carbon owners and and carbon um, producers. In other words, utilities that are producing uh, carbon emissions, coal companies, many of the oil companies have all been eliminated from the uh, stock portfolio, and that would be one of the largest of the active management, actively managed portfolios that we have in our public equity portfolio. Thank you. Regional Mari. Thank you. Uh, Chair Anderson, I actually I want to uh, go to page 73, and, and you don't have to, to go to move there, but um, Director Parks was so eloquent in the way that he did not discount performance versus peers, but highlighted the thoughtful process that they have of where peer performance is important and the weight that it should have. And I just want to really highlight that as we are constantly in the game of rankings in peer comparisons and so on and so forth, but they've shown a process where they said, this is what makes sense for us, and this is where we want to go, and I think we can adopt that as an institution in virtually everything that we do um, as we continue to give some weight to peers and to rankings. Thank you. You know, in my opinion, that's a, that's a very good thought process. Um, I have a question. I have nobody else that has them. So our operating budget, if we do a good job and keep raising that at small levels, as the assets that you have grow and you look for the cash flow that we might need in an emergency or something, does the stability bucket take on a smaller percentage of the assets as the assets grow because it is more in raw dollars? Question. You know, I, I think the target range that we've described is 5 to 15 percent. The, the target, we think, that under normalized circumstances is the 8 or 9 percent. So as the bucket or as the overall endowment grows, 8 or 9 percent of that will, in, it will increase with size. Um, so I, I think that's uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second is, depending on the circumstances, um, there is a fairly significant range here from five to fifteen percent. So we, we can easily raise cash or increase the size of the uh, stability bucket if we see headwinds, choppy waters, if there for some reason is um, a, a, a hiccup in the broader budgeting or operations of the university. So this is a bucket that is highly liquid and one that we have probably the most flexibility to make changes in on short notice as need may require. Thank you. Um, no more questions? I, one clear. Senior Vice President Burnett. Just, and Stuart, maybe you can just comment on that um, the proceeds of the endowment or the earnings from the endowment are largely spoken for in, in, in directed and constrained. So that while there might be some flexibility for us, um, it would be limited compared to some other levers we as an administration or the regions have because of the historical and the, um, the use of the endowment um, in how it was generated and what it's still continuing to provide funding for. I thought maybe yeah, just no, in that, that context. That's correct. I mean, the, the real, the primary, the first source of liquidity for the university itself would be the uh, funds in the tip pool. Uh, which is really essentially the working capital uh, account um, of the university. The, the stability bucket in the, uh, in the endowment is really designed to ensure that those um, um, areas where the uh, endowment is funding specific programs or research or um, chairs of departments and so forth to make sure that those are uninter there's uninterrupted funding there. 
one, if, if I might, one, one comment that I, I failed to make at the outset when I was sort of setting uh, the framework for the discussion um, this morning was, uh, and um, Senior Vice President Burnett uh, referred to sources of funding and so forth, um, it should be noted that of the billion three, uh, something in the order of 45% of that comes by virtue of us being a land-grant school. So it is rents and royalties from largely the mining industry and the timber industry in the northern half of the state. And that's a, a, a legacy uh, that uh, has initially established the endowment at, at the outset of the university um, and has maintained uh, something in the range of 45% of the overall uh, portion. The other portions have been uh, gifts that have come over the course of uh, years up until the point where the foundation itself was established about 30 years ago where most of the gifts were directed to the foundation um, and since then we've lived pretty much on the rents and royalties, uh, land grant rents and royalties and other uh, miscellaneous smaller amounts of cash flows. It would be that that cash flow difference, us being relatively modest today, it was more when the mines were more active uh, and you know, the very significant fundraising efforts that the foundation makes, those differences in cash flow really are one of the primary reasons why we would have different um, uh, risk profiles and different asset allocations for the way in which each of us manages the pool of capital that uh, we're charged with managing. So if you may have heard uh, any of the foundation presentations lately, you would know that their asset allocation structure is quite different than ours their risk profile is very different and, and to some degree their return expectation different. In a very general sense, I would say they are better positioned um, for declining markets in, in a somewhat more conservative uh, point of view. So we are likely to do better in rising markets such as the last four or five years. Um, I think if uh, markets uh, decline in the, in the coming years as they might, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised that they would uh, marginally uh, perform better than we do. Thank you. Regent McMillan, you have another question. For a comment, Chair Anderson, and thank you for the, the opportunity. One of the beauties of a committee of the whole structure, which we're, we're working from today, is I'm not burdened with the, uh, the, the chair role, and as a good chair, you wouldn't uh, throw out a comment like the one I'm about to make, but it, it goes to the very core of why I'm a regent. And Mr. Mason, I so appreciate you raising the fact that close to half of our endowment comes from natural resource-based industries, and as we work forward in a, in a strategic plan for the system, I, you will continue to hear me talk about how do we honor that, what can we do as a university as we put our education and research and outreach missions together to help reflect the fact that we were given that gift and it is the fact that we're a land-grant institution that got us that. Many institutions would die for that kind of a resource base and uh, anyway, I thanks for indulging me but I'm mostly recognizing you for putting that context in front of this board again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hate, to, I hate to even say this, but we're a couple minutes ahead of my proposed schedule, and, and uh, I would just like to ask the student regents that are sitting out there, you've got these gentlemen sitting in front of you, do you have any questions on anything they've said so far? Um, have you ever thought of tying students into this process? Just because I found myself even learning something as a presentation, I what we imagined what they could learn from the Vice-President Mason? Uh, we actually think a fair amount about it. Trying to figure out the vehicle is sometimes difficult because the day-to-day -day operations um, are reasonably complex. And in many cases, most of us are out of the office traveling someplace, visiting with managers and so forth. We do have several of my staff who are um, uh, advisors in the student-run funds at the Carlson Center. And so we are, are trying to uh, assist with both the um, <coughs> fixed income funds and the private, uh, excuse me, the public equity managed funds by, um, um, uh, by being advisors to those funds. And we periodically are asked to give uh, lectures at some of the uh, classes. Uh, we have in the past had students as interns during the course of the summer. Uh, which has been very helpful for us and I, th I think a good learning experience for students. Um, this summer we have not had that uh, ongoing. 
That's thank a you. Good question. Thank you, uh, Student Representative Dean. Sure. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson. I, I was wondering just a little bit about our land grant university and the type of funds we get from that. Are we still actively getting funds from, like, say, mining or timberland? Um, uh, yes, yes, we are. As I alluded to in one of my previous comments, um, uh, you know, the, the land grant uh, legislation uh, donated uh, federal lands to a series of uh, public universities in the mid or late 1800s. And so we are, uh, while we don't manage the lands directly, uh, we are the recipient of the uh, a royalty or a portion of the revenue stream that comes from the sales of the mining activities, primarily iron ore on the iron range, and in some cases um, royalties that come from timber harvesting uh, in our natural or excuse me our national forests. Uh, there is a smaller degree of farmland rent in southern Minnesota, but yes, we still receive funds. In total, uh, in the past year, it was 13 or 14 million dollars. Um, so that's uh, a smaller number than it was uh, 25 years ago when there was much more significant mining going on. Uh, but it is a steady uh, flow, of, uh, albeit a modest uh, inflow of cash that we still receive. And then, Chair Anderson, if I may, um, do you see going forward possibly with um, like the mining restrictions kind of coming in like the arrowhead of Minnesota, would that have any impact on the university's income? Mr. President Mason, Dr. Parks, either one of you. You know, I, I, I think um, uh, the, the it, it, it's hard for me to forecast what the restrictions are likely to do in terms of uh, changing the cash flow. I, I think the, um, the iron ore industry specifically is one that has gone through um, peaks and valleys over the, you know decades and is still a vital part of the uh, global economy, uh, albeit somewhat reduced from what it once was. So I think our expectation would be a, a continuing, relatively steady flow from that. There is timber harvesting um, royalties that also are added in the mix that come from the national forests I mentioned. So I, I don't see major changes in uh, that amount. Um, if in fact there are new, um, new precious metal uh, mines, you know, copper nickel mines or something like that that uh, get built over the next few years. I know that's currently a controversy, but if that were to come to, to play, um, we, we would be the recipient of revenues from some of that activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we're ready to move on. I guess we're ready to move on. Thank you, Vice President Mason, Director Parks. Thank you, students, for your, your activity there. That was good to learn. Um, we are going to move into the consent report, which is a item for review and action. Um, I hope you've all read it. There's, I think, three basic things in the consent agenda to uh, be voted on. If there's no objection, I'll entertain a motion to recommend approval of the consent report as appears in the docket. So move. Linda, uh, Regent Cohen, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second, Regent Beeson. Uh, thank you. We've got a motion on the table. I'm going to ask Senior Vice President Burnett to walk us through those consent items. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, there are uh, three purchases of services of goods over a million dollars. Uh, we do have folks in the audience if you would like more details on these, but I think they're pretty straightforward in the sense that um, the first two were done through an RFP process and, and are long-term in nature, which pushes the value of the contracts over a million dollars. Um, the, the third one that was added to your agenda late um, was uh, the TCF Bank naming um, piece that is in page 97 and 98 of the of a revised agenda. And um, as described to the board in separate correspondence and in the information on page 98, um, we will be asking for your approval of an uh, enhanced sponsorship agreement from TCF Bank to Athletics um, that uh, has been a work in progress for several months and um, I'm happy to take questions on that. We also have two real estate purchases in the consent agenda, one with respect to research and outreach at, at, at our lake, uh, 
Lake Itasca up in Clearwater County. Um, we have not ever owned our own property up there. We're, we're kind of renters on the state property, but uh, we, we were given the opportunity um, and helped the College of Biological Sciences to acquire right at the headwaters of the Mississippi. It gives them incredible research opportunities and um, we, we did our due diligence and we feel good about this purchase of uh, um, about 63 acres up in Clearwater County to support the research around the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And the second one is one that our staff have been working on for quite some time, the purchase of 614 Huron Boulevard Southeast near the southeast corner of the East Bank campus, a very strategic acquisition as we um, work together to, to piece together the parcels that are uh, between the Clinical Sci uh, Services Center that we jointly have with UMP and Fairview and the main campus. So um, this gives us the opportunity as described in the board materials to make some real estate moves and move some, move some uh, entities that have been long in our way of making those connections. So these are, I would suggest to you, two very strategic real estate purchases, one on the research side, one on the assemblage side for the East Bank campus. Happy to take any questions that members of the committee have on these five items. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, we have some questions, Regent Omari. Uh, actually, just, just a comment. Um, I'm excited to see that we're buying that plot off of Huron. Um, I, I had a friend on campus who went here and hasn't been around for a while, and we exited Huron in the plot directly across the street. The excitement that he had when he saw the University of Minnesota sign right there, um, even though he used to live in the building that was there, was uh, uh, exciting for me to see. And then we're taking TCF separate. So wait on. Not as of now, I guess it, we can it, stop. It's been added to the agenda, agenda, so it was the fifth thing I discussed, yes. I, I would just be interested in, in some more detail around how the deal is actually structured and works with the eight plus four option. Um, and I understand there was some benchmarking across the country as well. And your Vice President Burnett. So when we sat down with TCF to talk about assisting in the cost of Athletes Village, um, it was, uh, a back and forth uh, nature and President Kaler was involved uh, at the outset. Um, Athletic Director Coyle and I spent quite a bit of time with TCF leadership. Coach Fleck actually assisted in the discussion and the ask. Uh, what they proposed back to us was two parts. One, they would make an upfront capital gift of $8 million. Um, and two, they would like an option to extend their naming for 10 years. Um, their current naming agreement ex uh, ends in 2031. They would like a 10-year extension, and if they exercise that extension, um, they would have only th three years from this month to make that decision. And if they did that, they would give us another $4 million up front and annual payments for those 10 years under the new schedule. Um, when we benchmarked this against what we've seen across the country for college football stadium naming agreements, um, we, we had uh, analysis done at Candle by, by uh, uh, Mr. Mason and Mr. Parks. Uh, this fell in the top three in the United States um, as an enhancement to what we've already received from TCF. So we are um, uh, very appreciative of their commitment to this university. Um, as I've learned coming here, their involvement with bringing Gopher football back to campus was paramount to the state support of our stadium. And they wanted to renew that commitment both with a contribution to Athletes Village, but also a recognition of their name um, that would be uh, a little bit higher profile, which you're seeing more and more of in college football. Um, so I think we struck a really good balance uh, with them. And uh, it, uh, I think it's a, a really good step forward for both intercollegiate athletics, the university, and I think they're very, very pleased with the outcome. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I do support the uh, the consent agenda. The um, my recollection uh, as it relates to TCF. My recollection from the original uh, project was that the that the university had the right to um, uh, buy back the naming rights in the event the TCF bank sold. And that would have been a cost to us. Do you know if that lang language is still in there or been changed through this? this amendment at all? Mr. Chairman, uh, Regent Beeson, we did not open up those parts of the agreement. It was really an, an amendment to the current agreement, so I believe that those any of, anything we didn't touch in the prior existing agreement would still be present. 
Um, so I'd have to, we were really looking at the plus in the future, not looking back and at the past, but uh, we did not completely remake the deal. What we did is amend it in, in a pretty sh short three-page amendment. So that would still be in play, um, but I would have to con Thank you. consult with counsel on that one. Thank you, Mr. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of quick questions and then a, a comment, if I may. Um, uh, you, you know, it, we talk about uh, private support uh, for Athletes Village, um, uh, but it also kind of feels like it's a bit of a, a sort of a marketing enterprise as well. It, if because the way that it's worded, it says that we, we received the eight million, and then in recognition of, we will place the name in two places. Um, but if we were not to place the name, we would not receive the $8 million. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Regent Rocha, that was part and parcel okay. of the uh, agreement struck that, that we are proposing for you to Okay, ratify. so, all right. I just want to make sure, because when it says in recognition, it sort of feels like maybe it's a voluntary act on our part, but it's actually the contractual um, underpinnings of the $8 million. As we described in the memo, there's an expectation for us to raise their profile at the stadium that they already have their name on through that field mark. E expectation or requirement? If it's not on the turf, there's actually a reduction okay. in annual okay. payments as we described to you in that correspondence. So um, it, it was part and parcel of the of the negotiation. Okay. Thank you. And, and the second question then, Mr. Chair, is is, is then, the, so you've got the, that goes to the, the, the logos on the field on and right off the field as I understand it. Would that then be, if the second option is exercised, the field logos would be part of that additional period, correct? They would run, Mr. Chairman, Regent Rocha, they would run concurrent with our, so the field marks would run concurrent with their naming agreement, which currently runs through 2031. Okay. So what we've agreed to is the field marks would stay through the term of the agreement, and if they extended, then the field marks would continue through 2040 through the 10-year extension, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, so my, 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 thank you. My commentary on this is, um, is I, I have really appreciated TCF's relationship with the university and, and, and the uh, support for the stadium and the naming of the stadium, and certainly TCF has been, uh, had a relationship with the university and students and, I mean, for, for many, many years, and I appreciate that. And, and actually, when I, when I look at this, um, I, I have a bit of discomfort because I mean, maybe this is a governance and policy conversation we should have, but under what circumstances something is review action at the same meeting, um, why that is, because I you know, feel like I'm trying to uh, sprint to catch up here on this topic and would like to understand a little better at what point in time that would, would, would be um, part of an under, un, understood standard. Um, but I, I kind of see that there's a bit of a distinction between the two different parts of this. Um, I think that the eight, the eight million with the logo part, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, I think it's great, and it certainly reflects some protection. Um, I, I, I like the language, I, or I should say I understand why we're using the language we are, but really it's a contractual uh, exchange. Um, and, and, and there should be no misunderstanding about that. But, um, you know, in the front-loaded fee for that um, is, is uh, advantageous, particularly in our current uh, fiscal environment. Where I find a bit of discomfort is is in the second part, the option part, um, uh, because you know we are now committing regents who will not be elected for 20 years um, to this um, this arrangement, and to some extent the option feels like more like a fixed price or, uh, option as much as it's anything else, you know, for that for that front loaded payment, um, and and where I'm uncomfortable is that I I absolutely understand why the current administration, you know, it, particularly as we're, we're pursuing the Athletes Village and so on, I, I can understand why they would, you know, why it's advantageous for us to have that money today. But we are really tying the hands of future you know, administrations. I mean, we may be a, on a second or third president, you know, by that, by that point in time, um, you know, it, as if, if you look at sort of the normal life cycle. And it's, it's a little bit like in college, how I used to take on debt when I was 20, saying, well, that's 30-year-old guy's problem. 20-year-old guy's going to spend the money. And, um, you know, uh, with all credit to, I think, Jerry Seinfeld um, on, on that topic. But as I look at this, um, you know, Athletes Village, you know, I, it, 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 it struck me as remarkable when, when our uh, 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 gibson Nagurski complex was old and antiquated. To me, that was still the new football facility. You know, 
come, come 2033, Athletes Village is going to be obsolete in the arms race for athletic facilities. And so we're going to burn all of our capacity to generate that income in the 30s in, for this current facility. I, 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 I'm concerned about what that does for uh, future boards and future administrations, future students, um, in their ability to maximize revenue because the environment might be very, very different. And, you know, $1.3 million may be a substantially smaller amount of money than peer institutions are receiving for that same kind of naming right. So I'm, I'm very much supportive of the, of the, f the first part of this arrangement. But that extension that, that takes us into, you know, generations, you know, it'll be Omari 3 by then probably. Um, that uh, that you'll be dealing with the, the 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 inability to generate that revenue because because in 2017 we we tied the hands for 23 years so um, it, without more understanding about about that um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the second part of it fully support the first part um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the option portion thank you any other comments uh, Regent McMillan thank you Chair Anderson and in, in response or perhaps in response to Regent Rocha's valid question about the second half, my, my understanding is that this, like most commercial negotiations, probably, while it would be nice to bifurcate it, I don't think it can be. And you look at the full 12 million, as, as, as you did the analysis, it looked like a very solidly, a, a very good deal against any benchmark you and, and Vice President uh, Mason came up with so I you're spot on in terms of trying to bifurcate it. I just don't think we can and without without the eight you don't get the four without the four you don't get the eight so appreciate your comments Regent Rocha that's my understanding and dealing with administration was that it was a commercial transaction and negotiation and taking it apart at this point would be pretty tough but your comments about finding the future right on uh, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple questions here regarding the, the TCF um, agreement. Um, since this it looks like this is coming in under purchases of good, purchase of goods and services, a million dollars and over, but we're not really we're not buying anything here, right? Is it uh, Senior Vice President Burnett? Mr. Chairman, Regent Shu, it was really the avenue, it's the same avenue we brought in the Coke contract extension back in the June meeting. There really isn't a format for, you're right, we are not paying TCF, they're paying us, but it's the format that we use with historical practices of the board to bring it in. So we brought you revenue contracts under this mechanism, and this isn't the first one, and it's been the historic practice of this board to use that mechanism on the consent agenda. So, Mr. Chair, is there is there urgency in getting this um, approved today? Is that why it came in at the last second? I guess I would yield to Vice President Burnett, Senior Vice President Burnett. Mr. Chairman, Regent Hsu, um, we, we would ask that it be approved today. Yes, we've been working on it for quite some time and uh, wanted to get it approved so that, that the next home game, the field mark, could occur on the, on the turf. Um, we <coughs> specifically work to avoid a special board meeting for this. Um, but it is one of those we review in action where months of negotiation um, came came to bear with the deadlines looming. And I would also echo what Regent McMillan said: the option was part and parcel of the transaction, and they weren't. There were, were it was something that was part of the deal as structured and requested by TCF. And given their commitment, historical commitment, not just in this area but across the campus, we felt like um, the value both analytically and notionally made sense to the university. Regent Shoot. Follow, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that excla explanation. Um, it would be a little bit helpful to me if you could explain what the total value of this extension is. It's just, it, you know, there's a lot of math that has to be done in order to figure this out apparently. And I mean, I, if I look at it, I think it's, you know, 25 or more million dollars, but I, I don't know that. Um, by reading this, um, and I am a little concerned, as um, uh, Regent Rocha explained about the um, extension, because that is a 10-year extension, and it looks like it's maybe uh, I don't know, almost 18 million dollars in it, in addition. But you know, it's hard to know what the value of this that 10-year period is going to be on our stadium, you know, today. And then my my uh, additional question is. Where does the money go for the, uh, I think the yearly payments will go into the athletics budget, but 
what happens to the uh, option payment and the uh, $8 million upfront payment. Uh, Regent, uh, Vice President Burnett will ask if you can answer those questions. So the incremental value, not accounting for the time value of money, is about $25 million. When you add 10 more years at $1.3 million a year if they extend the option, plus the $4 million up front, plus the additional payment of $1.3 million that was not in the current <coughs> deal through the naming rights through 2030. So the extension and the upfront payment total is about $25 million. Secondly, um, that money is already pledged through the end of the bonds for TCF Stadium to fund that piece of it that the state is not funding. So the money would go into the bonds and as we described, um, they, the TCF negotiated a slight reduction in that, but next week we intend to refinance the taxable portion of TCF Stadium to more than make up for that. So there's no loss there to the athletic department, but the payments through the end of the bond issue and when those, until those are exhausted would continue and help pay off TCF Bank Stadium. The eight million will go into the capital for Athletes Village for construction costs and reduce the amount we have to borrow and finance there. The four million would be at the athletic department's disposal for a capital project or something, but of, mag of that magnitude, that'd be something we'd bring back to the board about if, if TCF within the next three years extends, ex makes the decision to extend the, the naming rights for 10 more years. Yes, sir. One more question, Mr. Chief. Uh, I know this extension has been talked about for a long time um, and your predecessor I think mentioned to me once that there was some desire to tie in some of the other TCF agreements into this extension. Is that what happened or are those other things still out there? Extension of those other agreements. Senior Vice President Burnett. Mr. Chairman, the only other um, TCF agreements with the university that were amended through this process were the ATM agreements at the stadium itself to go coterminous with their lease so that if they extend the lease, the ATM agreement would continue. But the other financial arrangements between the university with respect to the student services side and other things were not part of this um, deal. So it's only the ATMs at the stadium? It's not the ATMs on campus and other places? Senior Vice President Burnett. The ATMs at the stadium were the piece that we amended at their request as we were putting the final, final touches on the negotiation. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Beeson, I, I think General Counsel Peterson's here. Do you still need an answer to your question about uh, the other parts of the? Mr. Sure, Chair, I, I don't, uh, I don't need it right now. But okay. uh, thank you. So then we've got a uh, President Kaler. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Just to crisp up uh, the point that Regent Rocha made about the nature of this gift. It is important to distinguish between um, naming opportunities in which we engage in marketing, in which there's an exchange. And this is one of those in the 3M arrangement around Mariucci is one of those. Those are separate and distinct from philanthropic gifts for which there is no quid pro quo. The philanthropic gifts are counted in the UMF totals for the campaign. These kind of naming agreements are not. So you're correct to draw the distinction. Thank you. Thank you, President Keller. Anybody else? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, just to shore up and, you know, because this is a, um, you know, it's a, awkward spot uh, that I didn't anticipate being in a, a few days ago um, before this uh, came to light, but in, in, in responding to uh, Regent McMillan's comments, I, I think that you characterize that the same way that I see it. Um, I just, you know, having not been part of the conversation initially, and this is one of the challenges you have when, when our first input into a conversation like this is when it's fully baked and being put in front of us for a vote. You know, we as a board have a very distinct role um, for an institution like this, you know, just as the territorial legislature, you know, established a, a long-term vision for a land-grant university. We as a board have the long-term future of the institution at heart. We have to constantly be thinking about that generationally, whereas sort of the, the decisions in the immediate term, which tend to be more the province of the, of the current administration, will be focusing on how to maximize in the short term. Because we weren't part of that conversation earlier, I don't, you know, this is the only opportunity I have to weigh in on the fact that that option really feels like it's a price delimiter. And when you look at the fact that when the initial, in 2005, when the initial agreement was in place, the university was making a, a substantially different investment into the, into the, 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 uh, the, the program that performs at TCF Stadium. We are now spending substantially more money. We've got a couple hundred million dollars into a facility that should up the profile of the program. So in my view, that initial, that, that all inures to the benefit of, of, the, uh, of our partner. 
um, you know, when they initially sponsored the stadium, we were not making those investments. We now are trying to raise that profile, and and recognizing that in the in the 2030s, um, you know, I would I expect, fully expect that we're having a great success, and and it's a high and it's a marquee program. Um, I'm I'm just concerned about our, our limiting future members of this board and future administrations and students and staff uh, in their in their ability, um, and so that's that's why I find it, it uh, challenging to um, to to accept that portion of this agreement. Thank you. Regent yeah. Lucas. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I just have a question on the $1.3 million a year for going forward. Is that indexed or is that um, one3 Question, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, is that indexed or is that a flat payment? It's a flat payment, which is why when we did our negotiation, we pushed, given the time value of money is declining over time, for more upfront money would be of higher value to the institution. So we know that that 1.36 million in 2030 won't be what 1.36 million next March will be when they make the next payment. So um, that was why they responded to our request to more front load the, the contract and, and bring more value to the university earlier. We have a motion on the table. Uh, there, one more question, Mr. Shu. Regent Shu. Yes, on the um, uh, on the other uh, items, uh, one question on the Huron property: uh, how how does that compare to how much we're paying we paid for land in the past on, in that area, and is that kind of what we can expect uh, for, on future deals for that? I mean, I, I believe we should always be purchasing land near us because we're landlocked. But I just want to make sure I understand how much we're paying for those properties. Do you know that offhand, Senior? I've got some help from uh, Kelly Brands here from the real estate office. If he, or Mike can come up, I, I would just tell you this is my first real estate purchase since joining the university. I believe we are at appraised value there, um, but obviously the university can affect appraised values with its moves. So, Vice President Colna. Chair Anderson, Regent Chu, um, in that particular area, the most recent purchase we made was that block of land that we purchased. Um, that was a very unique situation. Um, and I would say that that is probably not a good comparator when looking at this one. In general, our policy and practice is, our administrative practice is, we pay the average, as close to the average of two appraisals on any given property. And in this case, rather than compare the price we're paying to, say, something across the street, um, it's better to bench it against the, uh, the uh, appraisals, and that's where we landed on this, as we're very close to sort of the appraisal. So uh, we feel pretty good that this is the right price to pay for this particular piece of property. Mr. Thank you, Regent Shu. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Volna, in, in this case, you were buying an apartment building, so the appraised value has to do with the income stream, I, I assume, in addition to the land value for the apartment. And in this case, we're actually going to tear down the apartment um, and use it. I don't know if a use has been specified for it yet already, um, but you know, I'm kind of try just trying to understand how much we're paying for this versus you know the next empty lot. Or I don't know if there are empty lots there, but <laughs> a lot with a smaller sized uh, building on it. Vice President Volna or Senior Vice President Burnett. Uh, Regent Shu, I believe we detailed in page 94 and 95 of the docket that we are going to, they are going to transfer this ground to us bare. They're going to bear the cost of tearing it down and the intended purpose was to relocate others from another site and we detailed that on a map on page 96 that are open to moving their operations or moving their facilities to this land. So the, the idea is we, this is a price for bare land. We wouldn't get the, we don't want the, we believe that that apartment building is at the end of its useful life and we want the land turned over to us in bare fashion so we can look at a transfer us uh, opportunities that would come back to the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then on, on one of these, uh, on the item um, involving the beer purchase, I'm just, I'm just wondering if that's enough um, to purchase um, the beer that we need for the season. I don't know who wants to answer that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Chair Anderson, I'm not going to try and answer that. We have folks from athletics who would be more than happy to talk to you about supply and demand for beer at the games. 
is there somebody here coming up? So I, I think it's uh, okay. I, yeah, and I just I just want to un understand it's a million and a half dollars, and, and I think it's over a long time. Yeah. Over five years. Yeah. Okay. Again, in the doc. Yep. Uh, Vice President or Athletic Director McGinnis. Uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Shu, uh, we worked on, based on previous year's spends, to try to determine the value we would need to go, taking into account. <coughs> Excuse me. In recent years, we've had some factors that significantly impacted our purchase. Certainly, the Vikings. We don't have that amount. That we're not having to purchase for those types of events. So we really was focusing on our estimates based on previous year purchases, knowing the events we would typically host in the stadium uh, and our other venues throughout the year. Thank you. So, Thank you. I, I'm just trying to understand how this works because I know that long time, a long time before I came on the board, we were losing money selling beer in the stadium. And I just want to make sure. We're not in that situation again, and I'm just, I, I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me that we're, like, do we buy the food for the stadium and all that kind of stuff, or is this a special kind of arrangement? I don't have that answer. Maybe uh, Associate Athletic Director McGinnis does. Uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Shu, uh, we don't purchase the food for the stadium. That's all purchased by Aramark, our partner. Um, the way the state laws work in Minnesota, since the university owns the permit for the alcohol, we have a permit for TCF, one for Mariucci, one for Williams. We are required to purchase and pay for the alcohol that is then provided to Aramark. They sell, they reimburse us the cost of that alcohol in addition to our commissions that we receive for those sales. Uh, and to your previous question, uh, in the first year, we did lose some money with our, with some of the startup costs associated with, uh, beginning to sell alcohol in our venues. But ever since then, it's been some, it's been a net profit for us. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Again, we have a, a, the consent agenda motion and second on the table. Mr. I, Mr. Chair, point, Regent Rocha. a point of, I guess this would be a point of order. Um, yeah, as we've talked about these items individually, would it be possible to have a separate vote on with respect to the TCF naming? Um, uh, right. My guess is you could move that. Uh, you can request. You, request you can request a separate vote. Yeah, I, then I, I would so request. And so the, the separate vote would be for the TCF uh, extension. Is that what we would call it? The TCF. Uh, the whole the TCF proposal. Correct. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chair, then I would move adoption of the consent agenda, accepting the TCF for a subsequent vote. Okay. Second. Is there a second to that? Second. Someone point out to me what we do with the first. So no, we, we vote on the consent. On, on, on as, okay, so we now have the consent agenda less the TCF proposal. Correct. That is what we have and it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion on that? None. All those in favor of the consent agenda less the TCF proposal signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now I assume we need a motion for the TCF proposal. I so move. Second. Uh, Regent Cohen moves. Second. Regent Johnson seconds. We've got the TCF proposal on the table. Is there any discussion in addition to that? Hearing none, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor of the TCF proposal signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. That motion carries. Um, so the consent agenda with the TCF proposal is. Uh, adopted. I'm going to go to the last item on the agenda, which is information items in your uh, in your docket. I don't know. We've allowed time for Senior Vice President Burnett to speak to them. I don't know if he has to or is there anything you want to say, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. We covered one information item at pretty big length about the uh, of the endowment. I just want to compliment Stuart Mason, Andrew, and the whole team about the the returns um, last year at 10.7. I believe they'll be some of the top returns for endowment in the country when we see what our peers do, which does matter on one level. Um, but otherwise, we, we certainly could be available and in, in know you have a busy, busy day ahead. I don't think there's anything else to add other than that. But. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll rec recognize a uh, motion for adjournment. So moved. So, is it seconded? Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Adjourned. Four minutes old. Well, thank you. Right. Oh, thank you. I don't know.